Legends Radio. I feel like I'm in the producers and I switched wardrobes with the other guy. Dr. Dr. Evil. I didn't spend six years of evil medical school to be called Mr. Thank you very much. Uh, you using the whole fist off? Never, ever, ever sleep with your boss. I'm so lucky that Jan and I only got to second base. Together they formed a band whose names and deeds were to be retold throughout the centuries. Legends Radio. The Great Wrestling Legends. The legends of the world of energy. We support this plan and will continue to support it. Uh, that's all I got. I don't know about the house. <laughs> Hey everybody, welcome again. A huge, huge Legends Radio show, but then we always do that. And uh, we, we just got, as always, as Evan always says, an eclectic mix. Somebody that I've been working on for, well, a little over a year is Wink Martindale, who is a total television, movie, stage. He's one of those EGOT legends who's done everything there is. And I didn't even know, we'll talk about his rock career in the 50s. And then somebody who I'd lost touch with the last, like, 18 years, but I was good friends with him, uh, Hustler Rip Rogers. I, I can't say any more. One of the most really innovative, smart, sharp guys, obviously more uh, people from today, younger people known from Ohio Valley. But he was one of my favorite, favorite wrestlers. And in one of my favorite guilty pleasure promotions, the Poffo Family ICW. And then Evan will... Uh, I'm sure Evan's got a ton of great guests. I don't know uh, who they are yet, but I know they're going to be spectacular. So we're going to start right off with Hustler Rip Rogers. And uh, Rip, you know, I, I hate IMDB because, uh, or this is Wikipedia, because I know there's usually a lot of errors in there. So, but I, what the, you know, stuff I don't know about you, was it 1974 you started and tell us, like if you grew up watching wrestling, where you grew up, if you grew up in the, was it Kentucky that you grew up? Oh man, I, I'm glad you look at Wikipedia because it's pretty much all horse shit on there. Okay, that's good. <laughs> anyway, I graduated from college in 1976 at the University of Indianapolis. Okay, I played football, basketball, and even scored two, let's see, two points in basketball, four years of football, four years of baseball. But every show I went down to the Expo Center to see Dick the Bruiser and the Crusher, Luke Cholock, Wilbur Schneider, Hanson Jimmy Valley, etc. I was even a member of the Hanson Jimmy Valiant fan club, just like you were president of the John Colos uh, fan club. I remember Marilee Needsel, who Evan knew, but uh, John Arizzi and I and Napolitano, we all knew she ran the Valiant's fan club. Right. But don't forget, I ran, in, in starting in 66, the Sheik's fan club. Then the Tolis Brothers, and then John Arizzi and I took over the Blassie fan club after my L.A. Territory boss, Jeff Walton, had to give it up. But I didn't know you were a member of the Jimmy Valiant fan club. That's that's huge. Oh, yeah. I had all, I got all the stuff out of the magazines. I had the Dr. X mask. I had the Destroyer mask. You know, so I had all the, all the gimmicks. All the, the, all the Dick Byer gimmicks. <laughs> Three bucks they cost in. <laughs> yeah, they, well, 3D. Dick, yeah, Destroyer, always- Doctor. Mm-hmm. But anyway, but no, so so with- what year did you start? How did you? So obviously you you know like all the good boys of that day, I'm sure you grew up loving it. You had uh, Dick the Bruiser's WWA promotion. You know the story, and then I should shut up. But in a nutshell, he came in for us in Los Angeles around '64 '65, and he won our belt, which was the WWA World Title, and then he didn't give it back to. Uh, to Jewel Strongbow was the booker or the promoter Cal Eaton. And then he goes and forms his own promotion, you know, in Indianapolis. He was already a star in the Midwest, all of that history in Chicago. And um, he didn't give the, the belt back. And so I guess the belt that he used 
because uh, he and Wilbur were a little tight with the buck, as you know. They never replaced that WWA belt unless it was stolen, like Ver Nick and Vern's belt, uh, Vern Gagne's. But he calls his promotion WWA. You know, everything after our promotion kind of blended in with the uh, – it merged with the NWA in 67. They had that Gene Kaniski, Bobo Brazil, title versus title, one-hour Broadway. But anyway – so how did you, uh, so let me let you go on and, and definitely tell us who broke you in. How did you, because uh, there wasn't really any place to go training there unless you went to uh, get ripped off by uh, Lou Klein's school. Oh, well, let me, let's see. I grew up in Seymour, Indiana. So when I'm in Seymour, Indiana, this is before cable TV. So I got bruises, uh, I got bruises wrestling on Channel 4 out of Indianapolis. And I got Nick Goulis' wrestling, which is blood and gut, southern style wrestling out of Louisville. Now, late on Saturday nights, I could turn the antenna around. I get the Sheets wrestling out of, uh, out of uh, uh, Detroit. Ohio. And I could also get Buzz Benson, all-star wrestling out of Paducah, Kentucky, if the antenna was just right, like one or two in the morning from Paducah, Kentucky. So I'm getting, so I subscribed to every wrestling magazine uh, that, that was ever invented. It was all out there. And I watched as much wrestling as I can. I bought all the wrestling gimmicks and everything. But there wasn't really any wrestling schools that I knew of at that time. Everything, everything was cafe. So I'm going to college now. When I graduate from high school, when I go graduate from high school in 1972, I'm saying I want to go to college, play football. But my big goal in life is to be an all-star championship wrestler. So uh, with that in mind, now I'm sitting in. I'm going uh, uh, sophomore year at University of Indianapolis. My buddy Tom Zupanzi comes down. Now, Tom Zupanzik, uh, he looked at Indianapolis Colts 28 years as an executive and a strength coach. He used to hold the world necklace record. He was also a member of the 1980 uh, uh, Greco-Roman super heavyweight. He was the ultimate on the Olympic team that, wasn't, that didn't go to Afghanistan. But he comes down uh, to, to college there. He says, hey, Scary, that was my nickname. My name, real name was Mark Shower. And he said, Scary, look, there's a thing in the, in the, in the paper that says wanted uh, wrestlers for sparring partners. Damn. Well, I go downtown, and there's this guy named Master Stevens. Now, he's not smart for the business, but he's got a, re a wrestling ring upstairs in an old VFW club. There's about 10 guys there practically killing each other. And I said, man, this is cool. So I get my stuff, and we start working out. And, uh, hell, I got my notebook, and I'm copying stuff off TV. I'm calling high spots rope action, shit like that. So uh, I'm meeting five or six guys there. They ended up having pro matches stuff like that. One was Steve Cooper, one was the Black Avenger, uh, uh, this guy named uh, Buddy, what the hell's his name? I can't remember. But anyway, so we're practicing in the ring, and I'm doing stuff Mexican style, right hand, left hand, or whatever. So I'm going to college, and then I graduate, and I'm a football coach at Union City, Indiana. In the meantime, my buddy Steve Cooper called me up. Now, Steve Cooper's one of the guys who trained with me, and he's somebody now, and he put uh, he calls me and he says, hey, uh, I just wrestled in Northfield, West Virginia. I said, no fucking way. He said, yeah. And I said, you're full of shit. He goes, no. I knew you wouldn't believe me, so I think the audio on a long-distance call, they played it back to me. I said, damn, so he plays it back. And here we are, Oak Hill, West Virginia, uh, 10 miles from Beckley, West Virginia. Shirley Love doing the play-by-play. -play. The original Cuban attack is on there against Steve Cooper and B.B. Coleman, who... Uh, did a job for uh, WWWF. So he says, well, the good part about this is I got you booked for next week. Damn, all right. So in the meantime, we go to Beckley, West Virginia, or Oak Hill, which is like 10 miles from Beckley, so uh, we're in our first match. I'm not smart in the business. Uh, or at least we don't know what the hell's going on. Uh, one buddy's going on, and uh, these guys are telling us what to do. He says, hey, you're, you look pretty good. You go over I said, okay, I'll go. What the hell is he talking about, right? So here's B.B. Coleman himself. He's in the ring telling me to grab an arm. Grab an arm. I listen to that son of a bitch. He's going to try and trick me, right? <laughs> so he hits me. I said, damn, that didn't even hurt. So he hits me again. And he says, sell. I went, ow, oh, shit. He's better. I said, hmm. Now I'm starting to get this shit, baby. Hmm. So in the meantime, I meet Angel and Savita. He's the original Cuban assassin there. And that's how the wrestling thing started off from there. So in the meantime, B.B., he's, so he's taking fresh meat up to the 
WWF, so he gets me booked up. And my buddy, Hank Turner, who wrestled with Hall School, another Seymour High School alumni and Concordia Teachers College heavyweight wrestler star, we all went up to the Philadelphia Arena. So I'm in, I got, I have, I still got the picture. Superstar, Billy Graham, autographed by Freddie Blassie, Gorilla Monsoon, Tanaka, uh, uh, Fuji, The Rock's grandpa. I got all these autographs and shit on this superstar Billy Graham, uh, uh, 8x10 glossies. Bob Backlund meets me. He takes me to the gym, works out with me. Hell, it's people screwing with me. Johnny Rogers protecting me from all these guys. Everybody's ribbing me because I'm so great. And you're taking my jock and hanging it up. Uh, I think it was the Lincoln Hotel there in Philadelphia. And uh, uh, everybody was ribbing me. Uh, but that's how I started. And then, uh, then I started working. Uh, once I uh, Bruiser knew I was working for these guys, I was working uh, TVs for Bruiser, TVs for Sheik. I would have worked for Nick Doolis. I worked for Bob Geigel at uh, Kansas City. Uh, uh, the, the, the chase there for uh, Muchnick and, uh, and St. Joe TV. And that's how I basically got started. Now I'm working with the, uh, the Bruiser, and Paul Christie comes up to me. Now I wrestled for uh, uh, Nick Goulas on a Christmas show down there. And so Carney from over, Don, uh, Don Pruitt, he got me booked down there. That's so why I met Lanny Popo. And uh, Paul Christie tells me the Popos are going to the Maritimes. So to make a long story short, I'm 22 years old, and I'm going to the Maritimes. So I meet Randy, Landy, and Angelo. And I'm off to work for the Maritimes and Amy Hill Dupre, and they're wrestling uh, four straight months, and they're wrestling every day, sometimes twice on Saturday and twice on Sunday. Hell, I was getting in a ring maybe once a week. So all of a sudden, after two weeks, I'm dying. Well, now I'm in a survival mode. So now Cuban assassin said he was working there, too. He said that uh, I was Hercules Samard because uh, they needed a French and they couldn't speak French. Uh, so I was Hercules Samard, and he said, uh, hey, Hercules uh, uh, Learn to work, or uh, you will go home. So anyway, that's how I started uh, in the Maritimes in the summer of '78. And of course, it's all who you know in the world of professional wrestling. So then, then Randy he booked me in Nashville for Nick Goulas. And then when I'm working for Nick Goulas, then Angelo books me down for Frankie Kane for the old ICW with George T. Colton in Mississippi. And then Lanny books me out to work for Don Owen and Gene Kaniski in Portland and uh, Vancouver. Vancouver. And then Randy says, come home, we're going to do some tapes. So we did some tapes at uh, WDR Beach 41 Studio in Louisville in March 13, 1979. And David Tung was a producer. As you can tell, i got a photographic memory. But we did these, uh, we canned these 10 tapes. So then we're basically, we got uh, 10 tapes in the can, and, and we're all working outlaw shows about four days a week. So we really don't know where the hell it goes. We basically, our first TV was in Hazard, Kentucky. So we looked at Lexington. It was pretty close on the map. So we, so Randy and I stayed in the Vandale Terrace Apartments, the old uh, $200 a month apartment. This was 1979, so we paying paid $100 a month. So all we did was train all day and and uh, work our outlaw shows. Now, in the meantime, uh, Orton, Garvin, and Root, and Dean Malenko's dad, Boris, they'd all uh, pretty much got into it with Ron Fuller, and they basically pushed Ron out of Knoxville, and he went down to Pensacola and opened up. We became business partners with uh, uh, Randy Orton's dad, Bob Root, and, uh, and Ronnie Garvin. So the ICW was formed. So the next couple of years, uh, we had TV in Oak Hill, West Virginia. We had TV in Lexington, Louisville, Evansville, uh, Memphis, and, uh, let's see, uh, two in Southern Illinois and two in Decatur, uh, like Springfield, Decatur, Illinois. So we ran all the way from Cape Girardeau, Missouri, uh, Beckley, West Virginia. We were in competition with uh, Bruiser, Sheik, uh, Jerry Jarrett. Bob Geigel, anybody in between, and, and, and didn't give a shit. Uh, I was having the time of my life, wrestling seven days a week, just hanging out. And uh, I bought in the territory, didn't want to, but Randy pretty much made me to. And uh, under the thing that I could stay there a couple of years and get the hell out, because all I wanted to do was, uh, I wanted to go to L.A. and work, because Piper had booked me in there after Oregon in 1980. And, uh, but... I had Randy said, no, come home and buy in this, and we'll get this shit going, and we can go out later. But all I wanted to do was go out and uh, 
uh, this is when the territory was still alive and meet people and learn uh, different techniques, different styles, because, hell, there wasn't any video. The VCRs were just coming out, and it wasn't like uh, you could learn stuff. Oh, but all this, before I got into business and I was in college, I was trying to get into Vern Gagne school. Vern himself wrote me a letter and said that uh, he had just got out of a class. This is one that the Iron Sheik was teaching, and Ricky Steamboat was in it, and uh, Buddy Rose was in it, and uh, they just graduated. He said I could get in uh, next year. But in the meantime, I'd bullshit my way in, and I, and I was off and run with this, and the rest is history. I don't know if you're still there. If I cut you off, and so you're just listening. And uh, <laughs> no, no, I want to bring up uh, Evan Ginsburg, but yeah, I forgot you would have uh, uh, Hiro Matsudas in Florida, Vern's later followed by Brad Rengans in Minnesota, and I want to get to more of the ICW. But before I forget, that's where um, we first saw One Man Gang as Crusher Broomfeld, and uh, Bob Orton Jr. was there, and of course uh, Ronnie Garvin. It was a Really fantastic promotion, and the first like uh, overtly Hebrew heel manager I'd ever seen, Izzy Slapowitz, managing the Devil's Duo. But before we get back on the love hate thing with Randy Savage, etc., I mean, and you worked everywhere, of course, Puerto Rico and Georgia Championship Wrestling, uh, what the last couple of years with Ole you Anderson. Run, you want me to run down it? <laughs> No, let me bring up Evan Ginsburg in New York because you mentioned the Tri WF, which was Evan's home base. Ev, yeah, yeah hi there. Um, you were talking about learning the business, and today one of the criticisms in wrestling is that, the, of course, you don't have the territories, and it's tough to make new stars. What, what would you suggest to kind of uh, you know make new stars out there? Because uh, you know you watch a lot of the TV, and these guys have been around forever. Well, basically, you can't. They ruined it. Hmm. Uh, Vince killed the territories. He didn't kill the territories. He just took all the money, and nobody else could run anymore. It uh, wasn't economically feasible. Now, I just think when WWE first went big, they raided every territory, major stars. Here's where all these main eventers working first match, whatever. Everybody knew who the hell they were. They all had a different look all different ages, all different styles. It was great. Now everybody's cookie cutter, you know. This bodybuilder doing this, generic promo, everybody's in the same generic age group. And, uh, excuse me, they're a double-A product being pushed off as major league. And that's the way it is. And uh, But if, if I'm a kid, they said, hey, there's the NBA, they're the best. There's the NFL, they're the best. There's major league baseball, there's the best. There's WWE, they're the best. And the only people that, that know that they're not very good is a bunch of old-timers, and pretty soon they'll be all dead, and, and nobody will know, and you'll think that the guys on TV are the, the greatest wrestlers in the world. And you have you have no idea who Jack Bristow was, Dory Funk, Terry Funk, Carly Race, et cetera, stuff like that. Oh, it makes me sad. <laughs> uh, I'm with you, uh, Jack Briscoe against Dory Funk, Ric Flair oh. against Ricky Steamboat. That's wrestling oh. elevated to art. Oh, yeah, no doubt, no doubt. Uh, Mr. Rogers, when you look back at your own career, um, what do you consider some of the highlights? What what comes to mind? I never really even thought about it. I just uh, All I wanted to do was get in a business. I wanted to uh, meet different people. I wanted to travel everywhere. And this is how stupid I was. Money never even crossed my mind. Hmm. Uh, because I was going to live the same no matter where I was at. I didn't give a shit about cars. I didn't give a shit about. I didn't give a shit about nothing, but uh, but training, uh, pretty much having a good time and uh, uh, living the life of a wrestler and having great matches and telling stories and making the trips with the guys and bullshitting and picking the brain of every old guy and see how he could help me out if I had a problem or whatever. So hell, here I am bullshitting my way into business. And I look at these great wrestlers that have their kids and they're brought up from day one. Known that the business is a work, they're explaining psychology to them. And here I am at 22, and hell, I'm not even smart. And then all of a sudden, how many years later, uh, Bob Geigel, the former president of the NWA, he's having me book his territory. Uh, Carlos Colon, he's having me as his so called booker. They're asking me for finishes, and I'm like shit in my pants, right? Yeah, yeah that's, <laughs> that's wild. Dr. Mike. Wow, he's got such an impressive. Uh 
resume and as you know he you know is, is as honest as they come and that's what i've always liked about rip and i remember the last time we talked and then we lost communication for whatever it was 18 years you were wrestling for Otto Vons and uh, catch in Aus- austria and uh, in germany and stuff do you remember uh, and then that's the power of the internet i finally somebody suggested i go to his facebook or something like that and i rehooked up but Tell us about that experience too. So you basically wrestled everywhere on earth. I don't know if you uh, did. You go over for uh, for Baba for all Japan or uh, you know yeah, later on. I well, for Baba for for two uh, two tours over there, and then I went over for Wing for Victor Quinones. I went over for Victor because Victor was working. He was a part owner of uh, with Carlos down there in Puerto Rico. So right, Victor right. says, "Hey, I want you to work in Japan and Korea." I said, well, I will if you book me in Mexico, because I just want to go there for a couple months just to learn the style, because it would be great uh, uh, feather in my cap, meet more people. You never know, because it was, it, life was one big vacation. So uh, I'm working for Baba, but uh, I got to work South Africa, but we was talking about working for, uh, as I call him, Big Fat Otto. So I'm going over to work for Otto in uh, uh Austria and Germany, and then I ended up meeting Regal, Finley, Dave Taylor, Tony St. Clair over there. So I'm the guy that actually, I got Max Payne booked in WCW. I wrote his resume out for Bill Watts, because I knew what Bill would like, and I also wrote the contact later for Bill Watts for Regal. So Regal got his first job in the States. Uh, we were sitting in a, a pizza place in Brock, and I said, hey, you ever been WCW? He said, no, you want to? Yeah. I said, what do you want me to do? I said, well, I'll write a letter for you. And you just send it to uh, uh, Bill Watts. About two weeks later, he got a reply, and then he was going in when we got there to tour. So all he had to do was just uh, <laughs> smile, and, and he was in. So working for uh, working for Otto, that's when I met Fit, and I told Ole, I said, damn, Ole, this guy's the greatest heel I've ever seen in my life, you know? Because I, I don't lie, lie to people. I said, man, this guy, he always says, well, how tall is he? I said, hell, only I don't know. How tall am I? How, I don't know. I just know that when a guy is good and people are standing and people want to love him, hate him, kill him or whatever, and this guy is a shit, you know, and that and that was it. Of it. But Regal, uh, he got in with WCW, then Fick come over, Taylor come over, and then uh, the pipeline was started all because they met my little ass, big fat ass, I mean, over in uh, Austria and Germany. And then Regal took me, and I worked for All Star there in England. Uh, we were supposed to work Dortmund, but uh, uh, they backed out there, so we had three weeks off. So I went to stay with Regal in Blackpool, and we worked all the clubs there. So I got to see the Carney things there with the, with the challenge things, where some were real where the, the guys were shooting with the marks, and some of them were total work. Johnny Smith, uh, uncle, he was he was running it, and he was nice as hell, and I got to meet a lot of people there. And I'm rambling, so... <laughs> is, it, is he is he legit related in any way to Davy Boy, or is that a work? I, I don't know. I, I thought they were cousins or whatever. But I, I know his last name is uh, Johnny uh, Bink, Hink, Hink, Binkley, Hink, Henley, Binkley, or something like that. Uh, and then no, because Ted Ted Binkley, because he he had something to do with training dynamite, so uh, with that. But uh, I get on a roll and I just start going. I'm sorry. Well, that's that a much. big deal. I'm going to throw some things at you. you. Just want really quick answers. Uh, and if you don't know, okay. Uh, Victor Quinones was he Corella Monsoon's uh, son in any way? Do you you know that old rumor? No, they always said he was. No, he was just a protege. He took a liking to him, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And uh, I was with Victor down there in Puerto Rico, and then I was with him at the wing promotion in uh, uh, in Japan and, and uh, uh, Korea. And then he was sending guys to uh, 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 Mexico. Yeah, Victor was uh, – I liked him. I never had any problem with him, you know, but then I didn't have to do any money stuff with him. But – you know, uh, I miss guys like him and Coraluzzo. They're real characters. Uh, Dennis Coraluzzo out of the Jersey, you know, just kind of reminded me of Victor and that he was always uh, hustling. Let me throw some names or some things. Uh, Flair and Hogan, I don't know if you kept up with some of their stuff, but embarrassments to the biz currently or? Well, in today's world, right, if you fart, it's on the Internet. 
because uh, I, I wasn't, I didn't smoke dope, you know, I, I wasn't a drinker, uh, never did cocaine in my life or anything, but in today's world, about anything else between the lines, I've pretty much done. And now with the, with the cart, with all these phones, this and that, blah, 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 anything you do, you bust a pimple on your ass, it's on the internet or somebody's stooging you off or whatever. So it, it, it's just really tough. Yeah, I mean, it would have been tough if, like, Johnny Valentine had to deal with TMZ and all of that kind of stuff. Or, uh, you know, when he and Rogers would get together separately, you know, they could maintain. But when you put them together they and throw in Bobby Davis, something like that, they were, you know, like pranksters. And they'd pull yeah. ribs, whatever. Lastly, before I have you go ahead and plug, uh, you were 43, I think, when you had your first three pro boxing matches. Yeah. And, uh one of them was a win by KO, which was a big deal. So was it Bobby Ducci? He was your uh, trainer, and he was a pro boxer, kickboxer, weightlifter. No, it was no. I didn't. No, I never had a train. I never got a ring in my life. See, this was the problem with IMDb and Wikipedia. It, it, so it says right here, Rip Rogers was trained by longtime friend Bobby Sweet Payne Ducci. Well, that's something he put on there. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, Rip. Um, and, and actually, I should ask you very, very quickly, um, did you, well, you had some heat. You left uh, ICW, and I think then that's when you went to work for Ole or uh, maybe Geigel again. There was some heat in ICW with Randy? Uh, what it was, I don't even know. I know that me and Randy were like brothers. Yeah. We did, we did everything together. He pushed me into bodybuilding, and then the problem was I, I beat him. <laughs> He'd, he'd want to challenge me to race, and I was too stupid to put him over, and I'd beat him. No matter what it was, then he'd get mad. Now, here he was. This guy was the smartest guy I ever met in my life in the wrestling business. As a performer, he did all our television. He did all the editing. This guy did everything. He booked the towns, and he was just busy being himself. And when I bought in, I didn't want to buy in because I was a total goof. I just wanted to be one of the boys. Now, these guys have already been in the business, blah, blah, blah. They understand it. They wanted to establish a home base. Hell, they had to corral me to get me to buy in. I didn't want to. And I told them, I said, hey, I'm not as smart as you. I don't have your experience. Don't be, they want me to run camera, do this, do that, blah, 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 blah. Well, all I wanted to do was get up at 6 a.m. and get my six-hour workout in before I could make the town. And eat, eat the buffet and uh, live the life and have my, have my match and then, then, then repeat the same thing 365 days out of the year. But Randy w was frustrated because uh, stuff just wasn't uh, going good. It was hard to make a buck. And here he was, one of the greatest unknown performers there was. And uh, so I said, well, you wanted me in, so you want me out, so I'll just leave. So Ronnie Darwin, he booked me uh, for Bill Watts, and then pretty and then then George left, George Weingroff, and then pretty soon it pretty much came crumbling down, and then uh, the rest was history. So well, the last time so I saw George, he was still wrestling, doing a sheet gimmick in Tennessee, but he could barely see. He was, uh, you know, sort of like Silento Rodriguez, except it was his uh, eyesight. You know, he had like Baron von Raschke, thick, thick, two inch thick. Uh, Glasses. We've got to let you go, Rip, but I want to bring you back because we've just scratched the surface. I am also going to nag you if you haven't thought about doing your own autobiography. You've done everything. Rip Rogers, absolute class guy, class athlete. Do you have any stuff to plug other than your Facebook page? Gimmicks or some people come into OBW? I, I don't have Facebook, Mike. I, was just, I, I just learned how to text about six months ago and started this Twitter thing. And I just learned a DM direct message about uh, uh, six weeks ago. So <laughs> I still think it's 1972. But we'll get together on that book eventually. Yeah, I really want to nag you to do that book because I think uh, the people that are still alive and, you know, they're just people like us around 56, 57, they're all going to want to read that. And uh, Lanny Papo, our dear friend too. But we will have you back. Maybe we'll have you on and reunite you with Lanny on the show. I'll, uh, I'll bug you, but I'm so happy to have uh, just made contact with you about a week ago, and uh, 
But Rip, so do you have anything to plug other than Ohio Valley Wrestling? And you also do seminars around the country, training seminars for uh, kids who want to be trained right. Yeah, uh, looks like the, my main thing is OBW. I teach there all weekends, and I and I teach. I don't teach math. I teach trig, I teach goddamn trigonometry. I had guys that do one hour matches, ninety minute matches, as a joke. Once they learn the goddamn secret. They got it, and they got it forever. The problem is, when you go outside my closed group, nobody else has got a clue. And that includes most of the, uh, the superstars you see on television. Excuse me. You know, but like I tell everybody, if uh, I'm going to teach you all these how to get by, and then once you get a job, forget it all. It will help you if you get stuck, but as long as you do exactly as they say, uh, they can't get mad at you. Don't think, just be a robot. If you're a robot for about three years, and then they can trust you, and then pretty soon they have a little bit of confidence in you. But uh, all the stuff I show you, forget it all. <laughs> it's so amazing, OVW. Rip, we're going to go to break, but the guys that you train, you and Danny, for years and years and years as the farm system feeder, the main one for uh, WWF, WWE, all of the talent from the Cena's to Brock Lesnar, Shelton Benjamin, uh, Randy Orton, Kurt Angle, everybody that came out of there now, however many years, uh, now the affiliation of OBWs with TNA, and uh, maybe I'll nag uh, nag whoever, Dixie, etc., to put start putting you on TV. But everybody, the one and only incredible hustler, Rep Rogers, go and do a, uh, well, if you do an IMDB or Wikipedia search, remember, probably most of it isn't true. But Rip, I'm going to nag you to have you back on the show. We've got to take a break. When we come back, TV legend and total icon Wink, Wink Martindale will be joining us right after these. Don't go anywhere. Beautiful. Thanks for having me, Mike and Evan. Thank you hey, so right. much. As I saw these cars in line, I wished me far away from here. Wish the clock could freeze the time since the day you disappear. I felt dizzy and insane There's someone turned to me to say Even if you feel this pain You should call me with a prayer Satisfaction guaranteed Turn to me with bloodstained hands By the way, I'm Mr. D could we share this nice romance? So we traveled round the world I took my life from floor to floor And he practiced various things And pulled out the door Make my day 
Live my life around the square So you see that he is me all right, we are back here on Legends Radio, and we're talking about legends, and we've had a lot over however many years Evan and I have done this show, but this is one of the absolute greatest, biggest legends. He is, you talk about Renaissance Man, he has done everything, and I was looking uh, online, I saw that he was a bopper-type amazing singer in the 50s and 60s, but he's been, I think he's in Guinness Book of uh, uh, World Records as a game show host, TV movies, producer, he's done everything. I, I'm sure there's been anything that you couldn't uh, name that uh, Wink Martindale has not done. Uh, I, I've been in, what, TV history, two of the longest-running game shows in TV history for almost 35 years and everything else. Everybody knows Wink Martindale. And now he's, uh, he's doing all sorts of radio, which he's kind of returning to his roots on uh, Sirius XM that we love. Uh, of course, the Sinatra Channel. Mr. Martindale, welcome to the show. And uh, you're back to your roots in terms of radio. Tell us, uh, how did all that come about? So you're doing, a, is it a, a weekly or monthly special on the Sinatra Channel besides the other radio work you're doing? Yeah, thanks, Mike. Uh, it's on the Seriously Sinatra Channel. Uh, I do a one-hour-plus uh, special monthly. They started in March of this year. Uh, they found out that I had uh, iconic interviews with uh, celebrities that are no longer with us, unfortunately. People like Nat King Cole and Rosemary Clooney and Perry Como and Sammy Davis Jr. and, you know, uh, Ella Fitzgerald. I'm doing nine of these this year uh, through the end of the year. Started in March with Nat Cole and then Rosemary Clooney and then Sammy and uh, currently the one that's running uh, is with uh, Gordon Jenkins, and the uh, next one that's coming up will be uh, in August, Joe Stafford and her husband, Paul Weston. Wow. But I kept all these interviews for my years on KNPC when I worked 12 years for the cowboy Gene Autry here in Los Angeles, and uh, the quality is as good as it sounds like they might have been uh, recorded yesterday. Fortunately, I had them all digitized, and uh, it sounds like they were recorded yesterday, so... Uh, uh, that's the basis and the background for it, and I uh, reproduce these in my home studio with the uh, proper music, and uh, I'm really proud of them, and I, they've re been received very nicely. Well, that's that's huge. I grew up, of course, down there, uh, so in the 60s, you know, the sophisticates listened to KMPC with Gary Owens and Rob, well, uh, <laughs> Robert W. Morgan, I thought after he was done at KHJ, then didn't he go uh, to KMPC with all the talent there? Yeah, he was morning man at KMPC uh, right until the uh, time that uh, he unfortunately left the planet and was a terrific morning man, as you know. Uh, that was a magical time. And, of course, KRLA and uh, that talent there. But uh, uh, it's – and some of the people that you uh, you, you worked with and uh, – well, you've worked and seen everybody. Um how did the uh, how did you, your start come about? And I'm sure you probably have a book, and everybody should go to winkmartindale.com for Wink's World, where he has everything there. The way it was, patriotism, which was uh, in some of his songs that he did, his classic songs. There was a lot of that there, which is applicable now, and uh, his whole career history. Uh, but how did you get into the business? You know, anyway, because you everybody knows you've been in the business forever and are still a legend and still active. Well, Mike, I, uh, I wanted to be in radio, I think, from the time I knew what a microphone was. I guess I must have been seven or eight years old when I just became fascinated with the sound of uh, radio. Uh, the fact that you could talk into a microphone and hear a voice on the other end of a speaker just fascinated the heck out of me. So I, uh, I knew what I wanted to do with my life from the time I was old enough to what, know what a microphone and a radio was. And uh, I had a Sunday school teacher who happened to manage the local radio station in my hometown, Jackson, Tennessee, a little town between Memphis and Nashville of about 25,000 people when I was growing up. I used to bug him to death. I'd say uh, to my Sunday school teacher and the station manager, Chick Wingate was his name, Chick, when are you going to give me a job on the radio? Finally, I bugged him so bad, one night he called me up to the radio station and sat me down in front of a microphone, gave me some copy to read and some commercials to read. I read them, and little did he know I'd been practicing for years in the back bedroom at home with uh, pages that I tore out of the Life magazine 
uh, advertisements. And I'd pretend I was on the radio, and I'd ad lib around these uh, advertisements from life. So when he sat me in front of the microphone, I did pretty doggone good. I think I shocked it. He said, hey, you come back down here tomorrow when the mayor's here, mayor owned the station, and uh, you can read for him, and we'll see what happens. So after school the next day, I came back down to the radio station, WPLI were the call letters, 250 watt tea kettle. And um, I did the same thing. I knocked him out. I got a job, 25 bucks a week, and that's how I got started in radio. And I was in Jackson going from the little station to the next largest, to the next largest station, 5 kilowatt station. And uh, after about a year and a half of that, I auditioned at WHBQ in Memphis and got that job. I was there for seven years where I got into television as well. And in 1959, March came out to Los Angeles. I was transferred by RKO from WHBQ and uh, been here ever since. Well, was, uh, was, it, was it an Art Lobo? Now, of course, I, so I'm looking right at your website right now, which I urge everybody to go to winkmartindale.com. And uh, you were doing mornings at KHJ, and then you had stints for literally everybody. KRLA, uh, wasn't Art Lebeau, was he the owner of that station or the pro PD? Or? No, no, he, uh, he was in the record business, but he wasn't, in, in the late 50s and early 60s, Art wasn't even on the radio. He's the one who launched the oldies but goodies line of, uh, of albums, and he made his fortune really and truly there. Uh, and then he got on the radio, and he's still on the radio uh, to this day. I believe he's on KRLA at least on weekends at night. And uh, but he uh, he didn't really get into radio until uh, the middle to or late 1960s. But Art's a very good friend. And this, I love uh, him yeah, I was trying to do that from memory because obviously I remember even in which shifts at KHJ, Robert W. Morgan followed you. I think six to nine. And then I forget if uh, Sam Riddle was 9 to 12 and Real Don Steele was 3 to 6 and Johnny Williams was like midnight to 6. But that's, you know, from around 65, 66. KFWB, I mean, you worked everywhere. And I should point out, too, before we bring up Evan Ginsburg in New York City, you get your star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, which is as big as it gets in 2006. Just And besides all of your radio and game show uh, accomplishments, which are... are more vast than I can even recount. Uh, you hosted the, one of the classic uh, teenage dance parties in Memphis as well. Um, yeah, when I was in Memphis, when I was in Memphis, I was sort of the Dick Clark of Memphis. Uh, that was when every city had its Dick Clark. American Bandstand was flourishing around 1956, 57, 58, and I had my local Coca-Cola show in Memphis on Channel 13. And um, and then when I came to California, I did one on Channel 9 and then Channel 5. Uh, in the summer of 1960, we took it outdoors to Pacific Ocean Park in Santa Monica, and it became a huge success. And then I left it in 63, gave it over to Bob Eubanks, and he took it over. And that's about the time I, uh, when I was working at KFWB doing mornings, I decided I wanted to do uh, start auditioning for game shows because I got uh, – Tell you how I got hooked up into game shows. I became addicted to a show called Password. You may remember that yep. one with Alan right. Ludden. Of course. I'd rush home every day. I'd get off the air and I'd watch that at noon. And and uh, I did a little research, uh, Mike, and I found out that Alan Ludden went in two days a week, recorded ten television games, and the other five days he played golf. And I said, you know, that's not a bad way to make a buck. <laughs> and so my agent started sending me on game show interviews, and I got the second or third one at NBC, a show called What's This Song? And it only lasted a year on NBC, but it got me launched into the business. And here I am, 21 game shows later. I think I hold the uh, Guinness record for it. I just beat out Bill Cullen with my last show at the Game Show Network. He He had 20 shows, and I hosted 21, which... I guess speaks well of you if you look at it in the positive sense. It means one of two things. Everybody wanted me to host their show, or I just couldn't hold a job. I'll, get, I'll let you be, be the pick. Uh, you're the king king of the game shows. Says, uh, uh, I was throwing some names at you by email. Steve Beverly, who actually I think it's Jackson, Tennessee, where he's taught courses, and uh, usually when uh, – a TV legend, a game show legend passes, uh, they'll get some quotes from Steve. But yeah, I remember going with the Dawson kids to uh, the second incarnation of Match Game around 74, and they do those marathon uh, tapings, and everyone, you know, they'd break after a show, change their clothes, so they would obviously not be wearing 
the same suit or dress. And uh, real troopers, Betty White and all of all of your compatriots, uh, it was just an amazing time. And I kind of lament uh, now sort of the state, you know, of the industry because, uh, you know, for example, with Family Feud, they've had about eight or nine hosts. There's no... Um, not tradition, but they're just, you know, the, the game shows are just not the same. I'm hoping they make a resurgence. Any, uh, any thoughts on how that might, you know, happen? Like soap operas, actually, you know, maybe it's cyclical. Soap operas are kind of on the wane, and they're sadly canceling a lot of them, and there's more reincarnations of game shows coming back or more Our business talk shows. Is cyclical. There's no question about it. I think that game shows in the classic sense will eventually be back. I have two that I've developed and am uh, beginning to uh, get getting ready now to pitch to the networks, and they are classic game shows. One, both of them actually have been on the air before. One was uh, developed and uh, created by the late Jan Murray, a show called Treasure Hunt, which was last hosted by uh, Jeff Edwards and Chuck Barris Productions in the middle to late 1980s. And uh, my associates and I brought that out of retirement, got the op- option, the rights to uh, – to redo that, bring it up to date for the 21st century, make it a million-dollar payoff. And uh, then I also optioned the rights from Bert Sugarman, a famous producer out here, uh, yeah. for a show called Celebrity Sweepstakes. And I always loved that one, and I think that could enjoy a resurgence in popularity, and we're getting ready to, uh, in fact, we just showed that show to ABC yesterday, and we're showing it today to Game Show Network, and we'll be showing it to other people. But... Uh, I uh, somebody asked me about a week ago, <laughs> Mike. Did you ever think about retirement? And I kind of like Art Linkletter. I stole Art's line. He said, "Retire from what? Hell, I'm not tired." <laughs> <laughs> so I keep at it, and uh, and uh, I just I just enjoy the uh, I, I enjoy the, the you know the fight, the uh, trying to trying to uh, get to the top of the hill. I've been there, and I've enjoyed that, and enjoyed a wonderful career. And I'm not ready to set aside yet and uh, start playing golf uh, seven days a week. No, I don't think your public your public would uh, riot. They would uh, demand. You know, they would want their daily fill of wink. Are you still? Uh, is it Instant Recall on Game Show Network? No, no, that's that. That was only on for about uh, 26 weeks. That was about uh, ooh, I guess four four years ago. Wasn't a very good show, but uh, wasn't done well. But, uh, you know, you win some and you lose some. You can't win them all. I know. You've done everything. And uh, before I bring up Evan Ginsberg, I think supermarkets or celebrity sweepstakes in 66, 67. I remember Jan Murray was one of my favorite comics. And he was on, I thought he was on that one on ABC, like mid-morning or 11 o'clock in the morning. No, no. He he didn't do celebrity sweepstakes. Didn't? No. No. He was on quite a few in the mid '60s, and uh, a lot of the top comics, you know, Rosemary, who was a, obviously well, she was more of a silent film legend or a child star, but also a comic, and you know, she all was of on that. Hollywood. She was on Hollywood Squares a lot, and also she was on Match Game a lot with Gene Rayburn. Yeah, oh, everybody, everybody who was, you know, super, super talented. Let's bring up Evan in uh, New York City, who I know grew up with game shows and classic good great tv too Uh, absolutely it's an honor having you on the show sir and uh i'd like to ask what advice would you give to young people who want to break into uh radio because you have such a rich radio history as well you know it's tough these days and i'll tell you why the conglomerates have taken over the radio business um you know a lot of the big owners uh the conglomerate owners own so many, you know, 200, 300, 400, 1,000 radio stations. And when I was growing up, uh, you could, get your, you could get, uh, get your feet wet in the business, like in a small town, Jackson, Tennessee, where I came from. You get on the radio, and you, and you get your experience by uh, just being on the air, you know. There's nothing scripted in radio. Uh, it's, it's mostly ad libs. So you've got to learn how to do that, and you've got to learn how to read. You've got to learn how to uh, sell via commercials. I used to watch as much as I could and listen to all I could uh, of Arthur Godfrey because I thought he could sell ice to the Eskimos. He was such a good sales. Art Linkletter was another one who was a terrific. I used to watch them and listen to them on radio and watch them later on television. Uh, I would say to a young person wanting to be in the business today, get 
if, if it's at all possible, it's not possible for everybody, I realize that, but uh, get a college education, at least a liberal arts uh, education. Uh, learn all you can at least in high school about the business that you want to be in. Uh, most, uh, well, not most, but many high schools and certainly all colleges these days have uh, broadcast divisions where you can learn television uh, broadcasting and radio broadcasting. And it's so much easier, really, than it was when I got started, to us in, in a sense. But as I, as I began with my answer, it also is tough because you can't get those jobs. So many uh, stations take syndicated radio programming from uh, uh, cities like Los Angeles, New York, Chicago, where uh, you know, they, the shows are done here and sent down the lines to small towns. And that knocks a lot of young people in those small towns out of work. And it uh, doesn't give them the opportunity to learn like I did. That's a long answer to your question. Yeah, yeah but, but great advice. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. And what, what is it about game show hosts that are so endearing to the public? You know, a lot of times people will look at it, an actor and, oh, what, what's his name? I, I forget his name, but everybody will go, oh, Bob Barker, The Price is Right, Monty Hall, let's make a deal, you know, Wink Martindale. And it's just you, you're, you're part of the American culture. What is it about game shows that make you guys so iconic? Well, you know, we came up at a time when game shows, the classic game shows, not reality shows, I don't call reality game shows real game shows, classic games like Match Game and, and, and Password and uh, uh, currently Wheel of Fortune, Jeopardy. To me, those are games, tic-tac-toe. I was lucky to have one that lasted over 10 years. And I think the fact that we came up during the 70s and 80s when there weren't uh, uh, a thousand different channels, to right, tune into, you know, usually a city had five or six channels, and that was about it. And uh, and now every it, it's a niche business. There's a little there's a little uh, there's a channel for for this kind of programming, a channel for that kind of programming, and this kind of programming, and that programming. And also, in addition to that, the fact that we had shows uh, like uh, Alex and 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 Pat, and so many of us had shows that enjoyed longevity, and people got used to tic-tac-toe every night around 6.30 or 7.30 in that prime access time period before you moved into the uh, prime time. Uh, and Joker's Wild, we, tic-tac-toe and Joker's Wild were back-to-back. And uh, we just really had a run of things for about 10 years, and then along came a couple of shows that uh, caught on, and uh, we kind of moved into the background, and they came to the forefront, Wheel in Jeopardy. And they're still out there, been on the air for over 30 years, if you can imagine that. That's, that's unheard of. Wow. And, uh, again, long answer to your question, but I think we came up at just the right time. And I think that, as I said earlier to Mike, these uh, classic game shows, a lot of these game shows are going to be coming back. They might not all look exactly the same, but the, uh, the prizes, the, uh, the payoff has gotten bigger. It all started with... Uh, who wants to be a millionaire where you could actually get a million, win a million dollars? I, I think they only gave away three or four times, or if that many. But uh, the fact that you can win so much more, uh, and people still enjoy watching people win, that's the, uh, that's the essence of a successful game show. People that sit, ho sit at home and, and watch, and once you can get them involved, and they start throwing things at the TV and saying to the contestants on television, I wouldn't say that, I would do it. Then you got them hooked. And uh, fortunately, that's uh, we we had them hooked with Tic Tac for a, for a number of years. That's great, and I I think also you're watching nice people, and you want them to win, and you're living vicariously through them. And for the time those shows are on, you're forgetting your problems. And uh, I I think in a in a sense it it, it it's very pure. You know, it's uh, today you watch reality shows and people are punching each other and cursing each other, and it's ugly in a sense. Yeah, really. I, it, it, I, there are very few shows. There are very like Big Brother. I couldn't sit through thirty minutes of that if my life depended on it. I don't mean to yeah. be knocking it; it's just not my cup of tea. Right. But people do enjoy watch people watching people win, and they they play the game and enjoy it vicariously uh, through those people on television. They they get the feeling that they 
they are up there, and they, uh, like I said, once 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 they uh, get uh, get hooked into the game and uh, Wheel of Fortune, you know, Jeopardy. I mean, there's no better format for a game show in my mind than Jeopardy. I'll give you the answer. You give me the question. What's better than that? Merv Griffin <laughs> came up with a with a landslide win with that one. And let's make a deal, Monty Hall. Right. That was so much fun, and people could get so involved with that. And it's still on the air. Right, that's right. Yeah, Wayne Brady, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's, that's right, that's right. I've seen it a few times. Dr. Mike. Well, and uh, one thing about, you know, I guess starting with uh, Queen for a Day or game shows prior to that is, as I think you mentioned, they were almost pure or TV's earliest reality shows. And I, I'm so old school, I miss Art Fleming hosting Jeopardy. That was my absolute favorite in the 60s. And I think those shows are so healthy. You know, we talk about how to exercise our, our brains and all of that. And, and perhaps, you know, because, uh, well, I'm getting up there. I'm 56, so our demographic is not always served by TVs or movies, but they certainly are by game shows, which I, I think I particularly got Jeopardy. i older than you, beat six. <laughs> <laughs> but I think Jeopardy is, totally, is probably one of the best things you can do for your brain. And uh, game shows in general, where you have to answer questions, be they history, trivia, or whatever. But uh, yeah, there are people who still put down. All through the years, a lot of people uh, would put down. Certain people would put down game shows as being just pablum, you know. But I say to those people, try playing Jeopardy and see how well you do. I try myself, and if I get ten or fifteen answers out of a half hour, I feel like I'm uh, five beta kappa. No, it's that's. Uh, the, that's quality programming and like everything Mike Martindale's ever done. Let me ask you quickly. I'm going to be seeking into Elvis Presley before we let you go. And, of course, winkmartindale.com is the place to go to find out everything he's doing. Um, Elvis apparently had said that, you know, his favorite wrestler, pro wrestler, was someone who actually claimed to have done, and there were several. I wanted to see if that's true or you remember any of these pro wrestlers that claim they did radio in the, uh, throughout Tennessee, either Sputnik Monroe or Jackie Fargo. Do those names ring a bell at all? Because Sputnik was uh, somebody that Elvis claimed. I guess he liked pro wrestling. And, uh, so I have no see... idea what you're talking about. I've never heard of any of those people. All right. Yeah, but you but did, I will uh... say this. I was at WHBQ Radio the night that Sam Phillips walked in with the very first Elvis record called That's All Right Mama. I was wow. there showing some around for some some football playing buddies of mine from jackson tennessee around the station i was the morning man and uh sam walked in with that's all right mama gave it to dewey phillips who had a show called red hot and blue playing black music for white kids in those days that was 1954 the month of july and i met him that night and uh, he was a friend until the day he died my wife of 37 years dated elvis for six years before we ever met so we have a common bond with the king of rock and roll wow uh, and you were longtime friends with uh, Elvis. So, so you know, Evan, you've been down there and uh, been to, I think, Sun Records. and uh, Oh, yeah. Just, you know, amazing. What is it about that part of the country? Uh, are people more creative there? Uh, you know, the music has just been phenomenal, both uh, R&B, soul, as well as country and western and almost everything else that comes out of, particularly Nashville. Okay. Well, in, 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 yeah, in Nashville, and of course, you know, everybody's familiar with Nashville, the king of uh, country, uh, uh, as far as uh, the country is concerned. But now they, uh, they have countries become pop, really. There's, there's no fine line between country and pop. But in Memphis, we had a, uh, an all-black radio station, which was really something in the uh, 50s, WDIA. It was the number one station. Uh, in Memphis, uh, far and above, had 60% of the audience. But um, I think that uh, you look at Elvis, who got started in 1954, the old truck driver from Tupelo, Mississippi. Uh, he, his, his style was an amalgam of uh, several different styles, and it sort of uh, set the tone for uh, what came out of the South in, in popular music. When rock and roll got started with Rock Around the Clock in 55, and That's All Right, Mama by Elvis, uh, the amalgam was he was a little bit of country. He was a little bit of, uh, of rhythm and blues. He was, uh, he was uh, religious music. He loved all of those different types of music, and it all came out uh, 
in, in, the, in the form of uh, what we later termed rock and roll. And I think that was, that was sort of what uh, Memphis and the Mid-South uh, uh, gave us in terms of popular music. It, was just, it just happened to, to, to occur in Memphis because that's where uh, Elvis happened to be driving that truck. Wow. And again, Winx, uh, not only did he sing, but his spoken word recording, Deck of Cards, sold over a million copies, peaked in the top ten in both the U.S. and England in 1959 before he went on. Yeah, you know, that record has followed me my entire career. I recorded that the first year I was in California in the summer of 59. It was a pop version of an old country record by a country singer named T. Texas Tyler. And uh, I was recording for Randy Wood at Dot Records. And when I came out here, we went into a studio on a hot... Uh, uh, Wednesday afternoon in July and uh, made that recording and uh, I, I remember telling Randy I didn't think he was going to sell because it was a semi-religious record and the number one record at the time things like Stagger Lee by Lloyd Price and Venus by Frankie Avalon and here, here I was making a semi-religious talking record for Pete Six at the, at, the, at the peak of rock and roll but it came out and it laid out there for a long time and Sometime around the latter part of September, uh, a DJ in Boston, Bob Clayton, on a number one station there, put it on the turntable one morning, played it, and the switchboard lit up, and it just it went across country like wildfire. And, boy, I guess within about, well, within November, the middle part of November, it was in the top ten. And I got, to, uh, I got a request to come back to New York to do it on the Ed Sullivan Show, which, as you know, was the number one variety show at that time. Oh, wow. And uh, it was like an out-of-body experience. I came to California, had my own radio show, my own TV show. It was a hit. I made a record, sold two million copies, three times in England it's been a hit. And I thought, man, I should have come to California sooner. This is easy. <laughs> <laughs> but then I discovered that it wasn't so easy to come up with a second hit. Uh, well, you've had many, many, many hits, and I know we've gone a little over uh, the time I promised you. WinkMartindale.com is the site to find out everything in Wink's world. Wink, anything else we should be plugging? No, no need to plug a thing. Just uh, delighted to talk to you guys and uh, appreciate the opportunity, and uh, it's always a pleasure. And I always enjoy doing this because I get to say hello to people who have been so doggone nice to me over the years and watching the shows, listening to the shows that I've done. So my thanks to, uh, to both of you for having me on. Uh, thank you, uh, sir. Everybody uh, loves you. And, of course, uh, Seriously Sinatra. I forget uh, uh, what channel that is on Sirius. It's on different, you just have to look it up. Go to the website of Sirius. And yeah, it depends on, on where different... you are. I think here in L.A. it's like 72. But uh, it de- Biden, what is it saying? 71. But it depends on where you are. And it's, it's different a, on it's uh, XM. It's a different designation, too. But seriously, yeah, yeah. Sinatra, which is an incredible channel, one of many, Martha Stewart, Oprah Winfrey, Howard Stern, everybody. You've got 150 you know. channels, I think. That's yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing. And, you know, it's the radio of the future. And, of course, Wink Martindale, always well ahead of his time. Uh, is part of that now. Wink, it's been our honor having you. WinkMartindale.com is the place to go for all things Wink. And with that, we're going to take a short time out and come right back with more of Legends Radio. As I saw these cars in line, I wished me far away from here. Wished the clock could freeze the time since the day you disappeared. I felt dizzy and insane. There's someone turned to me to say Even if you feel this pain Pain, pain. You should call me with a prayer Satisfaction guaranteed Turn to me with bloodstained hands By the way, I'm Mr. D Could we share this nice romance? So we traveled round the world I took my life from floor to floor And he practiced various things And to pull out the door
your knee is a heart which even bleed and a snake is in a tree make the beast again in me and he practiced medicine as he hitched from town to town even if he matched the game and in this endless dreaming All right, Evan Ginsberg back with Legends Radio. And over the years, you've heard a lot of music right here on Legends Radio from Edwin Vasquez, my buddy. And Edwin, of course, is the uh, house band for Legends TV. And we're having a big launch party on the uh, 27th of July that we'll talk about later. And uh, his brother, who's joining us now, whose music we heard early in the show, Roberto Vasquez, is an award-winning singer-songwriter from Puerto Rico educated in romantic ballads. The birth of his musical career began in Puerto Rico with the influence of his father, Roberto Vasquez Sr., who was a singer of boleros and lead guitarist. And we are honored to have Roberto Vasquez joining us on Legends Radio. How are you tonight, sir? All right, Evan. Thank you so much for inviting me to your show. And it's a great honor to, to have this conversation with you. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. And you've had a uh, very impressive career, uh, much like your dad and much like Edwin. You've uh, performed at Carnegie Hall, the Ed Sullivan Theater, Merkin yeah. Concert Hall, et cetera, so on. And uh, you know, t- tell us a little about yourself. Yeah, it was a great experience, and especially Carnegie Hall. It was a charity uh, concert that we did at uh, that time. And it was a it was a standing ovation, you know. Wow! I was so honored to to be to be in that uh, show, you know. What it what does it feel like to be standing in Carnegie Hall, one of the, one if not the most respected venue uh, in the world, and getting a standing ovation? What does that feel like? Oh, that was a a, a, a dream there. I thought I was in in, in a dream there. <laughs> I didn't think <laughs> myself, you know. Well, it was a, uh, such a great experience. Uh, it was uh, two times that I was uh, that I performed uh, there. They, they called me two times, and uh, as a guest, you know, like I said, it was a, a, a charity show for for children, and, and it was a great uh, experience. A lot of the people they they, they were very supportive, you know, and uh, yes. I was going to say, for the younger listeners, the younger musicians who listen to the show, the old joke applies. To, the The old joke applies to them. How do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, <laughs> practice, right, right, Roberto? A lot of practice. Uh, it's been uh, a lot of work, and you know, you know, like 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 my brother Evan, but uh, he has a lot of gigs, you know. Uh, so you know, many activities and uh, people that you meet, and uh, you know. Some people, they, they, you know, they try to give you a hand and help you. And uh, I was lucky, you know, I was very blessed uh, to perform in that uh, uh, famous uh, theater, you know. And, and, and you, uh, you, yes. you, you, you've played with such icons as Tito Puente, uh, Jose. Tito Puente. Who's, yeah. Tito Puente tell was us about back, him. That was back in, in, the younger, in the younger days. That was uh, when I was... Uh, uh, let me see. Let, let, let me go back. You know, about uh, I was about thirty years old. You know, and uh, Peter Puente was playing, and uh, they, they had a big, uh, uh, you know, uh, how you call it, Fifth Avenue uh, Black Party. 
-hmm. and they have a lot of two big orchestras. I think it was a Yogi Hano and uh, then Kiro Fuentes. And, uh, you know, I was lucky that I had a friend that he was playing in that uh, orchestra. So I talked to my friend, and he spoke to Kiro, and and uh, when all we were uh, they invited me to to to, to sing and uh, and uh, I saw and it was a great experience. There. You know, a lot of people were clapping. Edwin was there, but he was a kid at that time. <laughs> he he even remember, remembers that. You know? huh. And Edwin was, Edwin speaks of you with so much respect. And uh, of course, your dad as well. Tell us what it's like growing up in a musical family. Uh, it was something very, you know, very special. My my dad was like like you know he was a great musician, and uh, he used to every time he used to be heard. And I was always a you know I was a kid, but I was always a you know looking and uh, trying trying to learn. And uh, there was a singer named uh, Mark Antonio Muniz. And that time, uh, when I was a kid, uh, like 10 years old, I'm talking very, I was very young. And uh, he was a very, like, like a hero you know, back in my, those days in Puerto Rico. And I used to admire that, uh, that singer a lot. And then when I, when I turned out the TV, my father was playing with, with him. So that's how I, everything started. So when I saw my father playing with the, Marco Antonio Muñiz, a uh, Mexican legendary singer, that uh, gave me a lot of uh, inspiration too. So you know, uh, then when my father uh, came to to the to, to the neighbor to, to my house, and the whole neighborhood, everybody was sort of my father was, was like a hero in that uh, that night, you know. Wow! So that that's how everything started. Plus the trios uh, that he played, he played with a lot of good musicians, you know, Los Hispanos. Uh, Bobby Capo, I don't know if he, there's some names that maybe, you know, back in those days, they will be famous, you know, besides uh, Peter Puente, uh, Bobby Capo, uh, Joe Quijano, uh, the trios, or los, los, los tres haces, um, you know, uh, uh, my... so, a lot of memories. <laughs> Uh, that's great. Speaking of memories, my mom used to go to the Palladium back in the 50s to see Tito Puente and uh, mm -hmm. all, all the great Latin jazz greats. And, uh, you know, um, to a certain extent, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, yeah. it seems to me that a lot of these guys did not get the mainstream you know, acknowledgement that a lot of other artists did. I mean... Um, Tito Puente, Ray, Ray Barreto, the Fania All Stars, etc., so on, you know, did get huge followings here in the United States. But it seems that uh, a lot of the artists may not have gotten the acknowledgement they deserve. What, what's your take on that? Well, Tito Puente, is a, he, you know, the Fania All Stars, right? Oh, yeah. He, yeah. Yeah, he, he, he was involved in, in uh, that, uh, that pro promotion, you know. He, but it's he did, uh, yeah. But it, it just seems to me that as far as the mainstream American public, they they didn't. Oh yeah, see, I know what you mean. Yeah. Yeah, they didn't see as much of these guys as they would, you know, a pop singer or R and B singer. You know, it, it yeah. Just seems you know what happens yeah. like, in those days? Uh, you know, they, they didn't have the 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 like 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 now that we have the internet, all the. the you know, a lot of te technology that they could see the coast to coast of different singers from other countries. Those days, uh, you know, Channel, Channel 47, uh, Channel 41. It was only the, they, they used to watch it all, 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 only here, you know. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It, it's a shame because these guys were, and some of them are still with us. Uh, Eddie Palmieri is still here. You yeah, know, uh, yeah. But I think the average American may not be as familiar as with a, you know, a uh, pop star, let's say. And I think it's a shame because these are virtuoso musicians. Yeah, yeah that's true. They were not so lucky about the, the like now that, that we have all this going on, the Facebook, uh, uh, YouTube, uh, MySpace, all, all, all the technology that we have. So people could uh, learn about those uh, 
those, those singers, you know. They they could learn it by looking in the Google Google it, you know. Right. But uh, I mean, in those days, they 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 were not lucky to to for people to to see them there um, in different countries like now. You know? Now, there's a great documentary called Soul Power. And when Muhammad Ali fought George Foreman in Zaire, they had a huge concert connected with the fight. And at the mm-hmm. fight, at the fight, they had James Brown, the Spinners, yes, right. but also, also they had Celia Cruz and the Fania All Stars, and they were greeted mm-hmm. like heroes when they went to Africa. I mean, they got off oh, the yeah. plane, and it was like Michael Jackson was getting off the plane. It was wild, and it was great to see that. It's a great movie. If anybody hasn't caught it, it's a documentary called Soul Power, and I, oh, I really I, recommend. I gotta watch that. Man. Yeah, tremendous, out, huh? tremendous, yeah. And those, uh, were, those were great musicians. The people planted uh, Celia Cruz, and she was a great singer too. You know, she, oh, absolutely, absolutely. And I, I'm gonna just throw this out there. Um, when when I see you and Edwin together at different functions, I don't sense any competition. All I see is great respect and love and I, I he's always talking about how great you are and how great your dad was <laughs> and vice versa i i think that's a beautiful thing yeah because uh we we have a lot of good memories you know all of us my father you know played with uh, always uh with us you know and uh edwin when he was a kid you know you know great memories that uh we always uh, have that in our, our mind, and we we, we feel always that uh, uh, love for all those memories. Absolutely, and uh, make believe just for a second that Edwin was not your brother, and you were just judging him as an artist. I tell people that Edwin's one of the greatest artists I've ever heard. What what's your ta- <laughs> what's your take on Edwin? As an artist, he's the he's the best singer of the, of America for me. So not because he's my my brother, but I think he's a, one of the greatest singers. Yeah, That's, uh, in my, in my opinion, yeah, the, the best, the best. Uh, I don't care about Luis Miguel or Mark Anthony. He's uh, number one for me. Yeah, Edwin. He, he's uh... the man. Yeah, Edwin, it doesn't matter if he's singing in English or Spanish. It doesn't matter. The guy sings. He has the cry in his voice, like like the great soul singers. He has that cry in his <laughs> voice. Uh, I, I never get – I must have seen Edwin perform, Yeah, I would guesstimate, 35, 40 times. I never get tired of listening to him. I never get mm-hmm. tired of it. Yeah, And I, I'm, I'm not uh, just saying – thank, thank you for helping him. We, we really great for him. But, very grateful for that. You know? uh, we, 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 we all try to help each other. And uh, uh, my co host, Dr. Mike Leno in California, I'm sure he has questions too for Roberto. Dr. Mike? Uh, Roberto, what an amazing family. So much history and so many contributions by your entire family to uh, the whole world artistically. It, it bugs me now. I'm happy to see what they call world music, but world music, you know, I, I, it wasn't that long ago. I saw Hugh Masekela. And so they take Latin music and there's so many different types and like African music and they kind of lump it together and, you know, at cool. least out here and call it world music. But, um, you know, we always talk about that, but at least, uh, you know, attention's being paid to it, but I, I don't like stuff just being, lumped in there mm-hmm. you've won so many oh, so let me maybe let you elaborate on that and some of the many awards you've won like the latin ace award and uh, you've done so much best uh, artist of the year by the association of entertainment critics that was on your first cd yeah yeah that was the first production that that, that we did uh with the, my former producer that was in the name was uh jaime gutierrez that was uh the, and the name of the, the cd was uh Latino, so we, we won the the AFI Awards in, in 2001. Yes, and uh, then we did the second uh, CD uh, called Pase Lo Que Pase, and uh, we did the, the, the presentation on that CD in, in, uh, in the Hard Rock Cafe. And uh, now, right now, we're working in the third CD, in which my me and me and my my wife we working in, in that we right now, 
and hopefully we have, we will have that to be in uh, 2014. You know, slowly but surely. You know. Well, I was blown away. All these great stages you performed at Carnegie Hall, Ed Sullivan Theater, where Letterman does his show now, and everything. But obviously, the music, there's so many variances, so many different types of this in Mexico and Spain and Portugal and other Latin American countries, etc. But are there all kinds of nuanced, lots of different styles of music in Puerto Rico? Yeah, Puerto Rico has a lot of the different styles of music. They, they play the rock and roll. Uh, and also, there are our own music, you know, you know the bomba, uh, plena. Salsa, and uh, you know uh, different kinds of uh, music, like I was uh, mentioning. You know. uh, la last question: Tell us about uh, just the aura or the magic of Carnegie Hall performing there, the Ed Sullivan Theater, which is such a, a big deal. Both of those venues are like historic around the world. Manhattan Center—that's another huge one. Manhattan Center was uh, uh, performed uh, many times because uh, they used to do like a, a, a charity for the handicapped children every year. So I used to go the perform every year once a, once a year in that place, and uh, it was fantastic because it's a big uh, stage, beautiful stage, and uh, it was uh, something for for you know, for the benefit, uh, you know, for the children, and uh, we used to do that every, every uh, year, you know, in Manhattan Center. You know, Dr. Mike, you're going to be surprised, but uh, <laughs> Roberto, who sings all this beautiful music, he's an old school wrestling fan, right, Roberto? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, tell us, we, tell us some of your favorites. Who are some of your favorites? <laughs> yes. uh, from this era, or from the from the from the from the seventies. Yeah, from the seventies. He's an old school fan. From Mike. the seventies, uh, uh, Black Roman, uh, Goliath. Yeah. yeah. Uh, which one was the old one? Uh, uh, Andre. Well, those guys came into Puerto Rico. Gordon and Goliath would come in there. Uh, I mean, I used to drive Freddy, around. Freddie Blassie. Freddie uh, Blassie, remember? Oh, oh, yeah. well, well, Blassie in Puerto Rico, but Monsoon, we were talking about him a little bit earlier. Gorilla Monsoon would go down there with Bruno in the, the day when uh, Carlos Colon basically started. I think it's like 1971, 72, when World Wrestling Council started in Puerto Rico. So is that where you you saw these the wrestlers or when you came up to New York? Uh, when I came here in, in New York, I saw the, 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 the wrestling strong here, but then back in my country, I, I used to watch... Uh, uh, Carlitos uh, Colón. Carlos Colón. Uh, he was yeah. uh, the champion. Yeah, Carlos champion Colón and that. Miguel Perez. I got to see Miguel Perez Sr. I know Junior is a friend, but oh, Miguel Perez Sr., who was, he won the world title uh, with uh, Argentina Rocca for the, you know, in the Tri WF in New York in like 57. And there was nobody yeah, bigger right. there. And then, of course, Pedro Morales later on winning the world title. That was a huge deal for everybody. Yeah, yeah, I remember those, those, those days, and and, uh, and um, I know that uh, uh, Carlitos' uh, son, Carlos uh, Colón's son, is a, a wrestler too. And, uh, well, he's got like he, two or three, two or three of them, Carlitos, and then there's yeah, the other he's one. He's wrestling in Puerto Rico right now, the Carlos Colón, uh, Carlitos, uh, Carlitos Colón, I mean, the other one. And uh, his father is back in wrestling again, uh, as I heard, you know. He's, uh, a lot of people don't know in the in the New York Tri WF, you know, there was Pedro Morales and then a little bit under him Victor Rivera and Manuel Soto, Manny Soto. But Manny Soto had a brother who never worked in the New York, sadly. Roberto Soto only worked in Atlanta and Florida, and he was like a hooker shooter. He was a very tough guy, somebody you never messed with. Whereas Manny Soto was very friendly and outgoing and he had a bar with Victor Rivera. Uh, they own a bar together. Victor in Rivera, yeah, he owned Victor Rivera, yeah. And Rocky Johnson. Rocky Johnson uh, is the Bumpus. father of, uh, the, of the of the Rock, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I remember. Yeah. Yeah. You guys you were smell of uh, the Rock is <laughs> Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what would be neat is, uh, is if he had ever made, created any music, maybe not just entrance music, but music about wrestling. Have you guys ever 
than something wacky like that? No, but mm, it's, it's not a bad idea. No, no musica para lucha? Yeah. Musica para lucha? <laughs> sí. Why not? Then? We could do it, you know? There's a lot of memories that, uh, that we have uh, about wrestling, you know? Uh, my brother and uh, Edwin and, and I, we used to watch uh, John. Uh, Edwin was a uh, very big fan of uh, John, uh, John Tullis. Yeah. yeah, we love Tolis, and we love Gordon and Goliath. You know, when you see when you when you see Edwin again, yeah, tell him uh, to do an imitation of John Tolis. Okay, okay. Tell him, I, don't forget. You, you know, don't, don't remember Tolis Brothers fan club. Their only fan club that they ever had. I ran the thing in the <laughs> yeah. late sixties and seventies. Yeah, I yeah, saw yeah, yeah. I saw Tolis wrestle Bruno at the Garden. That's how old I am. <laughs> he was very charismatic. Uh, young, young Tullis. Uh, Tullis, you know. Tullis no, the, stuff, the good stuff was Tolis against Blassie. That was such a big feud. They had it every oh, two yeah. weeks for almost three years in a row, culminating. And then it was one of those longest feuds ever in wrestling. They wrestled in the 60s, 70s, and even the 80s, so like over 30 years. But it was so big, August 17th in 1971, they had – match at the outdoor Los Angeles Coliseum, which could seat 103,000 people. Now, granted, they didn't draw that. They drew about 38,000. But they set a record gate in attendance, which actually, I think, held to this day almost. And they were the main yeah. event. And the only other longest feud ever in wrestling was Bobo Brazil and the Sheik, which was the undercard match to John Tolis, Freddie Blassie, which was uh, out of this world, an incredible match. Yeah, yeah. They had millions of them. That's where Tolis was the first guy to bring a python out there decades before Jake Roberts. He brought pythons. Mm-hmm. He brought all kinds of stuff, dog collars, to protect himself against Freddie Blassie's knee drops. And this is where Freddie Blassie was a good guy. Everybody loved him, and Tolis mm-hmm. was the, uh, the Rudo, the heel. Yeah. Well, he was, uh, he was tremendous. He, 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 is he still alive, or he died? No, uh, but I, I was the pallbearer. His son, John Tolis' his son, Chris, uh, because I'd been friends with John forever and ran his fan club. He asked me to be a pallbearer at his funeral. That was about four years ago. So we lost both. Uh, we don't know if Victor Rivera is still alive, if anybody knows that there. But uh, no, John no. Tolis, Freddie Blassie, we lost both of those. Well, John, John Tolis, he's just not alive, right? He's no. Died, right? Wow. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the, anyway, Roberto, uh, please yeah. tell, tell the listeners how they could get in touch with you, any websites, how to, how to get your music. Um, the next minute or two are yours. Well, they could go to Facebook and uh, uh, go uh, to find uh, Roberto Vasquez, uh, Musica. Facebook and uh, the, my my other page is also with my music Roberto Vasquez on Facebook and uh, also uh, in the in the in the in this new CD that I'm uh, that we're making uh, Maria and, and I uh, so besides my my songs there are two songs from uh, two Argentinians uh, the the name is uh, Hector de Beirana and uh, Eduardo Garrieri. And uh, oh, before I forget, uh, if they want to see me, in, they, they, could, they could see me in YouTube, um, they, they, they can check out my, my music in YouTube too. And it, it's under Roberto Vasquez Musica? And in YouTube is uh, Roberto Vasquez. Roberto okay, Vasquez. okay. Roberto Everybody. Vasquez Musica, yeah, yeah. Okay, folks, we want you to check out Roberto's music. And uh, Roberto, uh, from a great musical family, and uh, his brother Edwin's a dear friend of mine. And uh, Roberto, thank you so much for appearing on Legends Radio. Thank really you. Do thank, appreciate thank you so it. much for inviting me. So, uh, and your show is a great honor. And I'm uh, and, uh, really grateful for that. And uh, I, I will send you a Hawks room to my, my house, to your station. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we're going to hear more music from Roberto later in the show, so don't go anywhere. Roberto, thank you so much for appearing on the show. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, 
the tears you cried my colors way your anger grew said we were true oh no I was so wrong I got to say that if I lose Evan Ginsberg back with Legends Radio and earlier in the show we had on an old school wrestling legend in Hustler Rip Rogers and right now we have from Dragon Gate USA they have a huge weekend coming up in the New York area on the uh, 27th and 28th I believe he is one of the top stars at Dragon Gate USA Johnny Gargano how are you tonight sir I'm fantastic how about yourself Great, great. And uh, tell us a little about yourself. You're, you're an upcoming star, and uh, you're making waves in the indie wrestling world, and you've wrestled all around the world. Tell us a little about yourself. I have. I started wrestling when I was eight years old, very young man. I'm 25 years old now, and I've been lucky enough to travel all across the United States doing what I love to do, and that's entertain the many fans of professional wrestling. I have uh, wrestled pretty much in almost every state. I've wrestled in Japan numerous times. I've wrestled in England. I've wrestled in Germany. So wrestling's been very kind to me, and I've gotten to see the world for free, basically, and get paid to do so, and get, uh, get to travel around the world and do what I, what I love to do, and that's uh, perform in front of the great fans of professional wrestling. That, that's great. And I went to uh, wrestling in England. My cousin lives right outside of Liverpool in Ormskirk. And I actually went to one of those um, 
like like beach towns where they had the uh, WWE impersonators. They had a British guy dressed as Kane speaking with, you know, with a British accent and a British guy dressed as The Rock with a British accent. It was kind of surreal, but uh, it was colorful. How did that come off? I, want, I, want, I can't even picture a British guy acting like Kane or The Rock in my head. Those two guys specifically. I yeah, can't figure yeah. how that would even come off. So I'm very curious yeah. to see how that would have came off. Well, what was funny was the little, little kids, they believed because they're little kids. You know, it's like at Santa Claus. You know, it didn't matter that The Rock had a British accent. But, uh, but the arena itself was very old school with a lot of atmosphere. And, and not all the guys on the card were impersonators. So you had some, like, really, like, old school, you know, like, William Regal, like, you know, straight up wrestling. And uh, you, you would have appreciated it. It was it – was, a fun experience. Uh, I don't. I don't know ethically or morally if it was the right thing, but it was uh, an interesting thing to watch. Well, Mike, why don't we just keep talking in case? Uh... <laughs> Maybe Rick. Yeah, Rick could get him back on the phone. This man. What I should say about Johnny when we get him back, he is uh, the Open the Freedom Gate champion, or he, he's got the, the belt right now. Uh, and has held it since January, so he's uh, he's quite the deal in uh, Dragon Gate. But he's also Russell. He's Russell for all the quality promotions. Obviously, at the top is Dragon Gate, but he's worked. I mean, for the amazing Ring of Honor, Evolve, Chikara, Pro Wrestling Guerrilla, which is you know closer to me. That's in the Los Angeles area. Uh, TNA. He's had uh, some matches with WWE tryout matches. But uh, we will want to ask him about winning the Open the Freedom Gate Championship, which is huge. And Dragon Gate has, you know, wrestlers, uh, a wealth of, of the greatest wrestlers from Japan mixed in with the top, top guys in the U.S. So uh, it's really amazing. And, you know, these are people that we know from Ring of Honor. If, if you haven't gone to a Dragon Gate show, I urge you to go. Yeah, if you love Ring of Honor, then uh, you'll love Dragon Gate, too. And um, we're going we're gonna to just keep chatting for a while until uh, our engineer, Rick, hopefully gets Johnny back. Um, so, Johnny, tell us a little about yourself. You wrestled all over the world. And uh, what's happening now in Dragon Gate? Who are you wrestling over the big weekend in New York? Over the big weekend in New York, I am taking on a, a former teammate, a former partner of mine. His name is Rich Swan. Uh, we are part of the first American stable in the history of Dragon Gate USA called the Ronin. And now it is me and him one-on-one -on, -one on the uh, 27th in Queens, New York. And on the 28th, uh, there's a big four-way, a Dragon Gate-style four-way with every, uh, a lot of, it's Shima versus Akira Tozawa versus Tomahawk TT versus Ada. That's four of the top guys from Dragon Gate over in Japan coming over to America to put on one, one amazing four-way match. And the winner of that match, I will take on later that night and defend my title against him, uh, my Open the Freedom Gate title, which I have held for well over 600 days at this point. So uh, that will be in Manhattan on the 28th. Wow, 600 days. That's, yeah. that's you, don't, you don't see much of that anymore. That's awesome. No, I'm coming for Bruno. I'm, I'm after Bruno's yeah. record. So i got a long way to go. So <laughs> There you go. There you go. And how, how do you feel when you see that um, guys who – you know, we're on the indie circuit for quite a while, like like Brian Danielson, now Daniel Bryan, and uh, Claudio, now Antonio, and uh, CM Punk, of course. Uh, they've really, really, you know, um, become huge superstars. Does this inspire you as, as you go on your path? Absolutely. Uh, you know, when I was younger, I, I looked up to guys like Brian. I still do. I look up to guys like Brian Danielson. I look up to guys like CM Punk. And I was huge fans of them when they were on the indie circuit. I was huge fans of them because I would go and I'd go to the high school gyms and I'd go to the small arenas and I'd watch them perform in front of, say, 50, 75 people. I was in the crowd. I was, I was a fan at that point cheering them on. And now to see them perform in front of 15,000 people, it was amazing to me. And so I, I got a chance to wrestle with Brian Danielson, uh, Daniel Bryan. And, and to me, he is the absolute best wrestler in the world and one of the greatest human beings on the planet. So to me, to sit back and sit at home and watch Monday Night Raw and see 15,000 people chant yes at him and go absolutely crazy when he's going to be in the main event of SummerSlam and challenge for the WWE Championship, that to me is the coolest thing ever. Because I remember Brian Danson when he was a nobody <laughs> and to see 15,000 people chant yes and him be the most over guy in the world right now, it's the coolest thing ever to me. And it just shows that 
hard work and talent. Because I remember, I remember when people saw Brian Danielson back in the day, and they said he's too bland, he's too small, he'll never be anything in WWE. But that 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 shows you right there. It doesn't matter if you're six five. It doesn't matter if you're five eight. If you go on television, you have true talent, and you love professional wrestling. You love this business. True talent will always win out, and I think Brian Danielson and CM Punk are perfect examples of that. I want you to know I'm an old school jaded fan. I've seen everybody, and uh, you know I I grew up on Ricky Steamboat and Ric Flair, and uh, even uh, Dory Funk and Jack Briscoe. And I tell people all the time, and I sincerely mean this: Nigel McGuinness against Brian Danielson was pro wrestling elevated to an art form. I mean, what these guys were doing time and time again was just like Briscoe and, and Funk and uh, Steamboat and uh, Steamboat and Savage, Steamboat and Flair. I mean, it's, it's really taking wrestling and making it into an art form. And, and, and I feel the same way about Dragon Gate. I mean, you guys do some you know, really remarkable wrestling. <laughs> Not necessarily sports entertainment, wrestling. And, and I'm, I'm very impressed by you guys. Well, thank you very much. And, I, and on the same token, I was in the crowd. I believe the first Brian Danielson versus Nigel McGuinness match happened in Cleveland, Ohio at Ring of Honor. Uh, the first one of the, the bigger ones. And I was in the crowd and I watched that match and I sat back in awe. And the match was absolutely fantastic. And like you said, I sat back in the crowd, and that made me want to be a professional wrestler even more. I was already training at that point. But to see the art form those guys were putting into their work and to see the, the level they're wrestling at, I sat back and I thought, I, I, I don't know if I'll ever be able to be that good. Now to be in the position to be almost that guy who's in the main event matches in Dragon Gate USA and all over the place, or hopefully there's someone in the crowd looking at me and saying, you know, wow, that's an amazing art form, and I hope one day I can be that good. That's, that's the cool thing to me is that, you know, I was that kid, and now I'm that guy. So it's it's amazing how the chain works and amazing how the process works. You know, like you said, Dragon Gate has some of the most athletic, outstanding professional wrestlers on the planet. And I've been on almost every single show since the beginning, and I still sit back, and my mind is still blown every single show because I see something new. I see something crazy. I see something amazingly entertaining every single show, and it, it just can't miss. There you go. And uh, Dr. Mike Lano in California, questions for Johnny? Yeah, I think Johnny might be, because I've shot Johnny for the magazines, particularly Gong and, and now more so Shukan Pro of Japan and PWI since 66. Shot all over the world. Shot in Cleveland in 73 when they had that three-ring circus. It was an all-day. It was called the Super Bowl of Wrestling, you know, headlined by Johnny Powers and Ernie Ladd, Abdul the Butcher, Waldo Von Erich. It was the one and only time that Chief J. Strongbow teamed with Wahoo McDaniel in a tag tournament. But prior to that, of course, Cleveland in the 50s and 60s was, it was like a real hotbed, sort of like St. Louis would become later on, you know, with Buddy Rogers and a million different guys, Ray Stevens, Roy Shires, all these guys there. Uh, but the few um, Dragon Gate shows I've shot, um, they were uh, it was like two or three in Los Angeles about a year and a half ago at the Russell reunion thing, and I don't know. Were you on those shows? Because and I was not. I was injured at the time. That was the one weekend I actually missed for Dragon Gate. I got injured the weekend, uh, a couple weekends before that, actually. Because that's the one weekend I missed. Yeah, you're like the only guy in wrestling I have not shot, and of course your record is impressive. And just looking at the, your, your Wikipedia, which again, as Rip Rogers said, it may be full of BS and may have inaccuracies. But tell us, you you did have, I remember when you had, uh, it was like after a Ring of Honor tryout or something, you had a hairline fracture in your back. Is that is that like the worst uh, and most serious injury you've ever had and, and most painful? Uh, I've had a couple. It's, it's mainly been back things, unfortunately, because, you know, that's what I've used mainly in my pro chosen profession. Uh, but uh, I've had a couple back things. I think it's, it's mainly just genetic, honestly, because my, my mom has bad back issues and all that stuff, so unfortunately I've just inherited it. Uh, but, yeah, I had a hairline fracture on my lower back. Uh, I had an ROH tryout match, and it was me versus Andy Callahan, actually. Uh, and we had an, I had an ROH tryout match, and we worked it and it was fine. And the next morning I woke up and I could already move. Uh, I could hardly get out of bed, and me being the idiot that I am, the idiot professional wrestler that I am, uh, I didn't go to the doctor or anything, and I kept trying to wrestle on it, and it just kept getting worse. And then at that point, I had to go to the doctor, and they told me I had a hairline fracture, and maybe I should rethink my chosen profession, which means maybe you should stop wrestling. And 
at that point, I'd been wrestling. I said I wrestled since I was eight years old. I started training, and uh, it was the first time I got in the ring. So at that point, I was around 19, 20. So I've been wrestling for a good while, and to find out that the rest of what you plan the rest of your life to be is just gone at that point, uh, it was really hard to hear at that age. Um, but luckily, I went to a good, a different doctor, and he realized that I had my left leg is actually shorter than my right, which was throwing my pelvis off, which was making my spine curve, which was actually hurting the, uh, was causing the bones to chip and whatnot. Uh, so luckily enough, he figured that out. He gave me a lift in my left shoe, so I wear a lift in my left shoe and my left boot every single time I wrestle and basically every single time I go anywhere. Uh, that helped me out a lot. And then later on down the line, a couple of years later, I had that match at ECW Arena where I lost all feeling in both my legs because I tore a bunch of muscles in my back as well, and I got carried off in an ambulance, and that was probably the worst one because that was the scariest one because I, I lost all feeling in both my legs about two minutes into the match. And I ended up still wrestling for another 28 minutes. Uh, so that was probably the scariest because I had no idea what was going on. And I finished the match uh, however many minutes later. And as soon as that bell rang, I, I was done. I couldn't walk anymore. I couldn't do anything anymore. I was just done in pain. And they had to call the ambulance. And the ambulance came and got me. And I spent a very painful, very scary night in the in a hospital in Philadelphia. I got on the plane the next morning to Cleveland where I was bedridden for about four days. And uh, then I went to the doctor and they realized I had a bunch of torn muscles and I was vitamin D deficient. Uh, so they had to do a bunch of stuff to fix that. I had a physical therapy for a couple months and I came back and I, I've, been, I've been good ever since. So <laughs> cross my fingers for no more back injuries. I seem to be pretty okay right now. But, uh, you know, it's always a scary thing, especially with wrestling. Uh, we get injuries all the time, and we're a special rare breed where we just keep fighting through them. I don't know how smart that is, but that's just how people we are, and uh, hopefully I'll be okay from here on out. Here's, here's my last thing, and, of course, you're the Open, the Freedom Gate champion. Um, all my times over there in Japan, um, you know, there can be a mangling of English, but it's, it's um, kind of charming in a way, and I think that's what Dragon Gate does that's kind of neat is – it's a Japan promotion, but it's in the, well, I mean, there's, of course, the Dragon Gate that's over there, but the uh, Dragon Gate USA is like a full scale. It's kind of what I was uh, the announcer for Mike Modest and Donovan Morgan's um, Iron promotion. It was sort of like a total Japanese promotion, but in the United States, and it had an affiliation with Misawa's NOAA. Um, so I see that when I, I look and enjoy that, but I've never asked Gabe about that. But um, you have worked for every top, 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 I mean, all of the best promotions, besides Dragon Gate, Ring of Honor, Chikara, Pro Wrestling Guerrilla, which I love since I live in California, and I call it the, since day one, I've called it the last 10 years, the Ring of Honor of the left coast. Mm -hmm. Are there any style nuances when you go to, uh, you know, to any of these top promotions, whether they're maybe a little bit smaller or they're big time, like, uh, you know, the top three in my mind, obviously, uh, Dragon Gate, Ring of Honor, Chikara. And I don't even know the status of Chikara, if that's a work, or hopefully they'll uh, continue. But are there little differences when you, uh, style, stylistic differences? Obviously, with Dragon Gate, you're competing with, you know, probably more Japanese guys than any other promotion you could be working. Yeah, I mean, it depends. I mean, I, I've wrestled so many different people where I've kind of taken styles from everywhere. Uh, I think that's what separates me from just the main hardcore Dragon Gate guys is I've kind of molded my own style into what they do. So no matter where I go, I wrestle pretty much the same style. I wrestle the same way. It all depends on the different character I'm playing or different uh, whatever I'm asked of me at the time. Um, but whether I go, whether it be Chikara, whether it be uh, uh, PWG, whether it be Dragon Gate USA, uh, anywhere in the world, I, I, I try to just be me because I feel if you don't wrestle – how you want to wrestle if you don't uh, portray who you want to portray it comes off as forced if, if you aren't just out there being natural and just letting things happen and doing what you feel uh, you naturally should do then I feel like you're just you're you're putting on an act as opposed to performing your way of art you're putting on just you know a show as opposed to just going out there and letting things flow because I feel when you're always yourself when you're always natural people can buy into what you're doing a whole lot more than when you're just you know out there <laughs> whatever other people want you to do. So I'm always me. And I'm always the same guy pretty much wherever I go. Well, Jenny, it's a real honor having you on the show. You're one of the 
it guys of today and wish you continued success champ because uh, you're total class athlete and that's the kind of wrestling i like watching i fall asleep if i shoot the uh, ringside at wwe or tna house show but i never fall asleep for any of the promotions you work for they're all the top uh top ones and you know it kind of makes me feel like i'm back in japan when i see you guys just totally kicking ass kawada style and doing all the stuff you do oh well, last question is your finisher uh an stf variant uh, it's kind of, it's like a, I have two different ones I'm using now. It's kind of like an STF, I'd say. Uh, it's like an over the shoulder cross face. It's kind of a, kind of an STF, kind of. Uh, I guess it's without the leg, so you can kind of say that. Yeah, very impressive. Yeah, I've only seen it a couple of times. I need to watch more stuff, more uh, Dragon Gate, but it just always blows me away, you know, the few times I've shot it. I just absolutely love watching it. Well, we appreciate it, man. Thank you for all your support. You know, you're, you're the type of fan we go after. Is the guys who are the hardcore professional wrestling, the guys who actually appreciate what we do in that ring. You guys are exactly what we're looking for, and we appreciate all your support. Oh, thank you, thank you, John. Johnny, I have, I have one final question. Um, you have such a great crew of wrestlers. Who who do you see? It, it doesn't have to just be your promotion. I mean, you you wrestle all over the world. Who are three or four guys that you're convinced are going to make it big in the future? Guys that are going to make it big in the future. Uh, I, of course, would have said Sammy Callan and Samurai Del Sol a couple, uh, a couple months ago, but we already know where they're off to, and we already know how they ended up playing out, and that's exactly how I expected things to go because they are very talented guys. Uh, I'll pick a guy right off the top of my head who has an amazing look and amazing athletic ability who you can see uh, at the Dragon Gate USA shows, and that guy's name is Ricochet. I think he is the best high flyer in the world. He can do some amazing athletic things, and I think uh, it will be a crime unless he is somewhere on television in a couple of years making a lot of money. And just, you know, he is highly entertaining and highly unique, and I think he is absolutely can't miss. Um, you look at guys like him, you look at guys like M Dog 20, Matt Cross, who is a, you know, an absolutely phenomenal uh, athlete as well. I think he's the best unsigned guy going right now. He doesn't hasn't has a contract anywhere, and I think he's very talented. Uh, then you look to the future, guys like, uh, again, another Dragon Gate USA guy named Uha Nation, who's this huge athletic freak of a man who's going to make a lot of money one day as well. So there's, there's a lot of guys, I think, you look at him, you look at a guy like Adam Cole. Adam Cole, of course, has gotten a lot of buzz, and I think you know it's only a matter of time until he's off somewhere uh, doing big things on television. So I think... The best part of that is, you know, there's so much talent right now in the Indies. There's so much talent right now in FCW as well. There's it's an amazing list of guys, but there's still a lot of talent here, a lot of young talent that is looking to make a name for themselves in independent professional wrestling. And I think if you sleep on that, you're really missing out. Go out there and support your local independent professional wrestling company, and you're going to see some great talent and some guys you're going to see on TV in the very near future. Uh, absolutely. You know, uh, sometimes I go to uh, a, a smaller local indie and six months later or a year or two later, you see the guy on TNA or in WWE. And uh, the thing that I tell people all the time about indies is it, it's basically the same price as going to a movie. You know, instead of paying some insane – I was at a WWE show for the first time in 14 years, and I regretted going, you know, and uh, – the tickets were twenty five to a hundred dollars, which is ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous to take a, a family of four or five or whatever the case may be for for a dragon Gate show or uh, other top indies it 's a very reasonable night out, and you get to meet the wrestlers, get autographs, take pictures, etc so on it 's just a more intimate you know experience I, I i i think indie wrestling and minor league baseball of all things are among the last bargains in live entertainment what, what's your take on that 100 percent agree i mean where else can you see a guy that you potentially see on television a couple months from now i mean and that, that you said it perfectly i mean i just went to the movie a couple of days ago and it was like what 12 dollars and you can go to a wrestling show. Some tickets are ten dollars. Some tickets are fifteen dollars, and you get almost four hours of action. I mean, it's it's so up close. It's so imper it's so personal. It's like seeing a live action movie right in front of your face and getting to actually meet the actors after the show. I mean, it's it, it, it's so amazing. It's something that you can't compare it to. I mean, I mean, you go to WWE. It, it's a big production. It's all this flash and all this all this pirate everything. It's it is an amazing production. I mean, it's a multi million dollar company. And when you go to indie wrestling shows. It's right there. You know, you're not sitting 
a hundred rows up. I mean, you're sitting right there. The guys are right there. You can see all the action. And and for me, I, I remember going to shows when I was a small child. It, 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 nothing compares to it. Nothing compares to being able to see those guys perform, meet the guys afterwards. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's the coolest thing in the world. It's like supporting your favorite band before they got famous or supporting your favorite actor before he made it big. I mean, you have a chance to see guys now who you could potentially see. Uh, and who knows? You never know what you can see. You may be watching the next Hulk Hogan, the next John Cena in front of you right now, in front of your very eyes, making an autograph for the mess of the show. You never know what that guy could become. So I think it's cool that you're able to get in on the ground floor and see these guys at this infancy of their career, and you never know what they're going to be later on. And also, what you're going to find is when you look back at your childhood, the time you spent at events like this, at indie wrestling, with your dad, you know, uh, it, it's among, or your mom, or both, it's, it's among your greatest childhood memories, and I think parents, you know, would be remiss if they didn't take their kids to uh, indie wrestling, and Particularly, <laughs> Dragon Gate, July 27th in Queens at the Queensboro Elks Lodge at 8220 Queens Boulevard in Elmhurst, New York. And the following day, it's going to be in Manhattan, a matinee, a rare wrestling matinee, 1 p.m. at the Highline Ballroom, 431 West 16th Street in New York City. And for all the details, you could go to Dragon Gate USA. That's www.dgusa.tv. Am I correct? Is that Absolutely. The, right on. Right? Yep. There you go. So uh, I have seen uh, Dragon Gate live. I've always enjoyed it. And... Uh, we thank uh, Gabe Sapolsky for setting up the interview. And, uh, Johnny, I want to see you headlining a uh, WWE or TNA pay-per-view in a, a couple of months, and we'll say uh, we had you here first. Best, best of luck. You never know what could happen. If you have the thing, you never know. We could be talking about this a couple of months from now. They remember when I did that interview and we did it a couple of months later? You never know what could happen. I mean, that's, that's the beautiful that's thing about right. professional wrestling, and you never know what could happen. That's right. I know. I I uh, I don't know if you know this, but I was the associate producer on the movie The Wrestler, and uh, you know Claudio was there, and uh, all all the ROH guys were there, and uh, you know a couple of years later, these guys became big big stars. A lot of them. So uh, you know, we wish you nothing but the best, and you deserve it. You've been out there a long time, and you know, you, it's great. It's great to watch you. We're jaded old school fans, so uh, when I say it's great <laughs> to watch you, I don't say this a lot. So. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. It means a lot to me. It really does. I really appreciate it. There you go. Next to Galloway, standing in the doorway. Look at him trembling, which I think you should admit. He's waiting for a sign of Mr. Handsome. Next to Galloway, still looks out for a sign. Now see that he's losing his village from. He will host the girls of Quince Crew in the dawn, like a spawn. Mr. Handsome goes to chest and booty. about he's stepping out now he's stepping forward into the guest line and his mission brings him back these good old days and a
Hey, everybody. Welcome back again to Legends Radio. Just a quick note, programming note. We will be off next week. Our producer, Rick Hendrickson, gets a well-deserved, it's probably a work vacation, but we will be, of course, back two weeks from tonight with a huge show. And speaking of huge, I was just listening to some amazing, amazing music there from our next guest. He is truly a citizen of the world, a musical citizen of the world. He's also a painter. Uh, he, he does everything. What a contributor to the arts. And everybody's talking about Matthias Sturm. His website, Matthias-Sturm-Art.com. And uh, perhaps there's others. But uh, it, that song right there sounded very Beatles-esque. Uh, it was born in East Germany and, uh, and then spent a lot of time in France. So he's picked up all of these great musical stylings. And, uh, you know, people have said that he... Uh, uh, has combined some great John Lennon and Pink Floyd. What what influence is there uh, for his song Peace on Earth? But just amazing music here. Matthias, uh, tell us a little about yourself. It's an honor having you on the show. What a great artist you are. Yeah, firstly, hello to you in the studio. I hope you, ha I hope you have a fan there, because I have one here. <laughs> yeah. so. I mean, uh, I see I see myself as a, as a storyteller, and and my lyrics have a strong poetic character, and um, mostly they are written in the style, you know, of, of a spoken word tradition that draws on on the romantic literature I love from the 19th century in England. Um, this was a very interesting phase in in, in history of poetry because they had this thing about to be a bit dark and asking great questions about life, death, and love. And um, there's a strong association to image and scenery, which allows people to to imagine themselves in any given situation. So it is it is uh, more subconscious writing, and uh, I always feel the most interesting songs come upon the writer when he or she least expects. You know. Well, I really love. Uh, I, w I would say I w you know I don't like categorizing music is not fair but i really love the music from europe and all the different countries very nuanced your producer dave hillis has produced pearl jam james blunt to name a few and yeah. is uh a pearl, one of pearl jam's total founding members uh dave cruzan he's is he still your drummer because that's a big deal yeah, yeah. I mean, Dave Cruzan is, is. I mean, he's not only a, a, a big drummer. He's, a, he's also a, a big friend of my of my music, and we've met uh, in Los Angeles during the recording session. And since then, we, we started on or, or we get on to to record together. And uh, I'm really looking forward to meet you on on my US tour because I'm actually in, in New York at the moment because I had a, a show on the 15th evening uh, at Rockwood Music Hall. And um, so I go to this night. I go out to Boston and then to to Los Angeles and um, having some shows there. Whiskey a go go uh, on twentieth, and um, then go to San Francisco and uh, Portland and Seattle. So, so well, then I'm going to see you because I'm a, a Los Angeles transplant. I shot at the Whiskey a Go Go when Johnny Rivers was there. You know, the, yeah. he was at that time the future of music yeah. and now everybody says you're the future of music matthias hyphen sturm hyphen art dot com and it's spelled m-a-t-t-h-i-a-s and your last name s-t-u-r-m but uh, do you know the venue so the whiskey a go-go is perhaps the most you know on the west coast the most historic musical venue i've shot everybody i know, there. I know. Yeah. that's huge do you know what venue you're playing in san francisco uh, San Francisco, this is a singer-songwriter show, you, you know, it's a kind of vanguard uh, evening uh, on on a venue, it's called, um, oh, let me think, I'm so confused with the seat out there. Um, it's, um, is it Yoshi's or, uh, or the... No, uh, no, it's, uh, it's um, oh, let me think about it, you know. I don't well, you're doing that, the stylistic... Even in case, even case it's a very, very nice singer-songwriter uh, evening with a lot of singer songwriters from San Francisco, and they put me in this show, and I have the last, very last set on midnight. So it will be it's probably, very... it's probably on your website because I was going to say uh, yeah, 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 for sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all announced on on Facebook, and I, I actualize these these things, you know, actualize these things uh, yeah. daily, and so all all the fan fan base can can have a look, and there's no no problem. With that, yeah. 
if before I go to Stylistics or at Yoshi's this weekend, I'm actually going to go and see them. But everybody yeah. should go, particularly L.A. and New York and everywhere. Matthias Sturm is going. Yeah. So, Dave, I'm going to let you take over the interview here. But, uh, Matthias, I'm re- just from that one song, I want to come and see you, and I hope everybody okay. in my neck of the woods, San Francisco, Oakland, San Jose, comes out as well. So go to Matthias' okay. website, and Ev will give that out a little later. Okay. So, so tell us about some of your musical influences, because it seems that they're really spread out from rock to jazz. I know you like Miles Davis and John Coltrane. Yeah, yeah. It's more, it's more, it's more jazz in the game than than rock music. So maybe it's astonishing, but um, you know, I can tell you what. But my very first, uh, you know, uh, thing of of music I can remember was a blues record. Which was recorded live in East Berlin in in '78. They had a. The, it was a very big American blues festival with all these kind of uh, old guys, you know, veterans from from Mississippi blues delta. And and uh, this was a, a heavy. Or these days, because these voices are uh, stood in my head, and uh, I, I would say it came all from from blues and then from jazz and from from avant-garde. Uh, stuff and rock was not really so in the game, you know. Hmm. And you quote, invite the listener to step into a Byron esque universe inhabited by muses. That's very interesting. Can, can you elaborate uh, a I, bit I, on I that? Heard it. I thought that you loved it. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I mean, <laughs> uh, I mean, it is what it is. Uh, I mean, Byron-esque universe, it, it, it's about how I uh, put these things together. It's really about uh, um, uh, rock and art poetry. It's really about poetry. I see it from, a, from, from the view from, from a poet who writes a poem and then get into this music thing and it's it's uh, it has a, a big shot on imagery and and uh, if you want um, a, a cineastic uh, feel so and th- this this popped into my head <laughs> you know i i find that a lot of pop music today is very simplistic you know uh sex drugs yeah, rock and is- roll get on the yeah. dance floor etc so on yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, you're you're like the smartest guy in the room. Uh, do you do you think the do you think Thanks so much? The, yeah. Do you think the public is can really handle this? I'd like to think that there is an audience for intelligent, uh, yeah. colorful music that mixes genres. Yeah. And, yeah, is, what's your take is, on that? I, I mean, you know, yes. I mean, I've, I okay. You, every artist has uh, uh, his kind of or uh, his quarter of, of, of public so if it's intelligent music then uh, it, it is something for intelligent people I mean they live on you know they exist anymore on this planet so but uh, if you talk about this music industry thing I usually ignore these guys so uh, I mean it's the best that you can do because if you're an independent artist look about you know you know I'm associated with, with uh, a guy you, you know very well Oliver Sean Oh, yeah. uh, from from you know, and so we I'm I'm on his management since since some years, and this is a great example that independent uh, musicians can 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 have a big shot on, on on the music market, you know, without being so what involved in in what is called uh, uh, music music management, because I, I can give you an example if you have a minute, because this is very sure. interesting. Once, once I had a, I had a very interesting uh, talk with a, with a uh, management, big management from Los Angeles, and the guy was ranging me from, from I don't know, from I mean it's kind of stupid thing to range an, an artist in vocal, vocal tone, shape, and all these kind of things, but he was ranging me from one to ten in, in all these kind of things, production and, and music style, and to eight point five till nine, to say. Uh, hey, this guy, this is very cool. It's it's a thing between. It's very strange, but it's a bit like Pink Floyd and mix of Beatles, Pink Floyd, which which is very cool. But in the next step, he he told me, but I I don't know where to market. You know what I mean? This is the problem. Oh yeah. If you oh, have yeah. if you have a, yeah, but I mean if you are, what a manager has to say, uh, I I cannot market it. 
you know, a man, the, the task of a manager is to, to is market, find the whatever, market. Whatever, exactly. yeah, to, you know, you have to, I mean, you, that means from today, from their view, an artist has to, to market himself and to find the markets to get the manager uh, uh, you know, it, it's, it's the wrong thing. You know, it's the wrong, wrong order. Absolutely. Of, of things. So, in New York, uh, in New York, we had a group called Dr. Bazard's Original Savannah Band, which later yeah. turned into Kid Creole and the Coconuts, and yeah. they were they they could not be classified. It was a mix of funk, yeah. and reggae, yeah. and jazz, yeah. and everything yeah. in between. And yeah. You know, August Starnell, Kid Creole, literally had to move to Europe because in America, you know, he, I, I know they, they couldn't pigeonhole him, of course, yeah. of course. Yeah. Yeah. But otherwise, I have to tell you that uh, from, from, from my view, as, in, as a European artist, I, 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 you know, with, with this album, I had a very big crush on, on the college radio call station Super here in the U.S., uh, and, and uh, the most of attention... In the in, here in the states, you know, from press wise, you know, I had a very rave reviews on, for instance, on on the big takeover magazine from Jack Rabbit, which is one of the coolest magazines out here in New York for for uh, you know alternative music, and um, so I think this is. But otherwise, I must say, and this is a, I think a great problem. I remarked this here at New York. Um, the, the exploitation of, of musicians, especially here at New York, is, is crazy. I think it's crazy. You know, I mean, the the, 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 the the whole condition, how how the system of booking is working here, uh, is is really really weird. So, and uh, I must say that we have some light and better conditions in Europe. It's not this strange thing of to be so what exploited. And uh, but I don't know how to fight. This thing, you know, because I think it's literally uh, something of, of the public itself to see what what they do, you know. Because if you go to Rockwood, and and you, you have a public which is which is not aware of what this means to have, uh, you know, an edgy performance. Like most of these artists are, the, the quality is very high, you know. It's a very high standard of of, of, of work, and uh, but nobody is aware about how how work it is to to do that, you know. It's uh, it's a very tough market. I mean, in New this is now. For, for, forgive me. It's, it's, this is a social problem. But I I'm, I speak in the name of, of musicians who, who have uh, here in the U.S. Especially, I'm I'm sure, uh, two or three day jobs, and then they have to to do their work at night, and they have to go from venue to venue to 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 pick up I don't know fifty dollars per evening. I mean, this yeah. is heavy. It's this brutal. Heavy. It's it's a brutal business, and in New yeah. York. In New York, not only are the artists exploited, but the clubs go out of business one after another because the rents are insane. So, yeah. uh, yeah. you know, so there's there's two sides to it. But, um, you know, there's there's too many musicians playing for free. Forget $50. And, yeah, and, yeah. That, and that makes it tougher on the musicians yeah, that are trying yeah. to make a living yeah, at this. Yeah, yeah. But uh, some of the club owners are fighting to survive as well. So, uh, and, and, and part of, and, you know, you can spread the blame around to the fans as well. You know, get away from your computer, get off your couch, stop playing video games. This is the next, go, this is the next yeah. problem, yeah. Yeah, yeah, go yeah. out and support live music. But, yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, so music, if, if you know, we have, we, there is a standpoint that music is free as from, from today. And, but it isn't, you know. You, you cannot, no, nobody can, 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 uh, can have this. And otherwise, if, if you want, really want to have an alternative uh, scene of, of music, which is a bit outside or beside of, of mainstream stuff, then uh, I don't know how to how to do, but well, we we get it done, you know. It's, I'm I'm pretty sure. It's, uh, but I mean, this 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 all has a limit. Also for me personally, you know, what sure. I do, what I can't do, or what I don't have to do, because I I mean, I you know, I'm I'm a painter as well. I, I'm I'm a think tanker. I'm a future scientist. I have several things uh, uh, and professions have to work but I mean it, it is what it is it is music is kind of covered love and, and passion and um, well well I'll tell you and, honestly Matthias I think what needs to be done is the musicians themselves have to embrace 
the technology and for example if you're playing in a small club and, and it's a, it's not a great paying gig, you know, stream it live throughout the world and this, this build, is, uh, build that uh, audience. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. There are some, some, you know, yesterday I, I talked with this singer songwriter, usually, you know, it was a barman. Yes. I mean, <laughs> so uh-huh. every barman at, at Brooklyn, maybe is a singer right, songwriter. Right. I don't right, know. Right, right, right. So, <laughs> and they, he told me about a story. There's a great venue out of, Brooklyn and the, the owner himself stream streams uh, the whole thing every every evening, and I think this is a good idea. So um, sure to, to have some yes to have some but as the out, artist, output output on this you know yeah yeah as the artist put it in your hands rather than the club yeah. owner and uh, you know you stream it and you uh, but otherwise. Otherwise, Evan, this only the other side is this, this is a very honest and and simple large thing. You know, not everyone can make it big in in this business, and and I, I think you you have to be as realistic as as you can be, uh, and and to say I I can do this and I can do that, and I have to. Uh, budgeting my, my stuff. Mostly, I, for instance, I I I have some insight and technology of, of crowdfunding and and all this kind of stuff. So you you have to see to to get your projects done. This is the first thing, and then you usually have to ignore what others telling you about this this all this kind of of, of industry stuff. And and because this industry also otherwise is dead. You know, there's there's nothing to 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 shake. Nobody shake anything in, 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 in this more major secrets of, of stuff. And if you see what a major artist has to do, it's from today, you know. But, but, you know, they have to pay everything. I mean, I know major artists, they pay for everything they do. Sure. So, and then you can you make, make, your, make your budget on, on this, you know. For instance, if, if, if the guy is playing, uh, I don't know, venues on, on 2,000 seats, and, and then you, you have to pay, pay the musicians, you have to pay the manager, you have to pay all in at once and, and then, then make the count what these guys earn. I mean, uh, I don't know if this is quite different from, from independent artists. It's, you know what I mean? I mean, this is, this is a very, uh, very crazy business. That's it cool. is, it is, and where the money is um, is really the merchandising. It's it's not yeah. the music. It's not the music yeah, anymore yeah. because yeah. the kid yeah. the kids have it in their head that I'm going to download it for yeah. free. So yeah. Yeah. you yeah. know, it's the it's the t-shirts and the posters. I'll tell you a band that you might want to study because they've they figured it out. Fishbone. Fishbone, yeah. when you see when you see them live, mu- musically they're brilliant, and then after the show, they're, they're selling thirty different things. I mean, yeah. it's like it's like yeah. a store. They have a George yeah. Clinton, P Funk, the, the same thing. Yeah. It's like yeah. a store, yeah. 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 and but, and that's where the yeah, yeah, that's where the money is. That's where the money. Yeah, but is, the, the thing, don't forget these guys are uh, these guys are already big. Uh, I mean, oh, you sure, can, can sure. Be, uh, you, you have to you can go in merchandising if you if you have quite a way uh, a fan base of I don't know. 100,000 people. But Fishbone, uh, Fishbone and, is still kind of underground. They're, they're not a commercial, commercial band, but they know how to market themselves. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And Matthias, uh, when you look back at your career, give us one or two highlights. What, 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 are, you, what are you proudest of? Well, I mean, there, there are a lot of uh, really highlight, highlights are, are um, you know, mostly I'm but I can, yeah, I can start off with. I made a lot of openings for for uh, you know European major artists, and then you, you know, I, I played a lot of very famous venues in in, in Europe. For instance, uh, BAB, uh, Ancien Belgique, uh, Brussels, or I, I played um, recently uh, um, a big festival in France, uh, Europa Box. Um, I. I think it's it's more about I mean this this independent music awards nomination this is this is a big thing uh, this, I mean this is more than a batch of distinction this, you know they have on their website they have one billion clicks in, in times of of the nomination uh, uh, week you know and this the, these things are really really great and I yeah I would say 
yeah, that's good. I mean, I mean to to be uh, in, in the top 200 of of the college radio uh, charts, this this is also something which is really awesome because. Uh, I miss this in, in Europe, you know, I really miss out to have this, uh, you, you don't have this alternative uh, radio system, so and mostly only major artists can can have their paid stuff on, on, on radio, and I mean, it's, you know, European radio is very stupid, and okay. there's no place for anything from, from, you know, they have no features, nothing, so this is a great thing in the US, I think, to, to have this, these more large college radio stations that can grab, I don't know, 100,000 people uh, in, in one region. This is, this is good, you know. Yeah. And they strictly well, play this crazy stuff like mine. <laughs> there you go. There you go. That's they love positive. it. That's they positive. Love it. <laughs> That's great. That's great. You're, fi- you're yeah. finding your audience. And Matthias, we must wrap it up. Please tell the listeners yeah. Yeah. where, they, where I, they can get your music and uh, all of that good yeah. stuff. Okay. Tell, tell the listeners uh, your, your, your website and how they can get your music. Well, the music, uh, the, this, the, the album, uh, you know, everybody can, can check this album out on CD Baby uh, under my name, Matthias Sturm. And usually on all these uh, kind of uh, large uh, music download sites on iTunes on, on all this kind of stuff. And um, you can, yes, you, 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 you took my website. You, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm really uh, appreciate of on anything, uh, nice comments on my, on my Facebook, on, on my uh, fans can, can Twitter me. So this is all to Google, you know, this, this is no problem. I'm, I'm, I'm first in line. If you have my name, Matthias Sturm, on Google, you, you get everything from CD by CDs or uh, merchandise or Twitter or Facebook. There you so go. And it's M8. This is really... Yes. M A T T H I A S S T U R M. That's okay. it. There you go. Uh, thank you so much for appearing on Legends hey, Radio. Thank really? you to be on your show. I mean, I love your show, really, really. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And our mutual friend, Oliver Sean, will be at my launch party for uh, Legends TV. And uh, you can check out Legends TV at legendstv.net. And. Um, We're going to be at Red 58, 158 West 58th Street, and uh, that's Saturday, July 27th from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. And uh, appearing live, Oliver Sean, Edwin Vasquez Musica, Lanny Poffo, the genius, hosted by yours truly, and Steve Ludwig. Steve Ludwig starting uh, his own radio show very shortly, and you'll be hearing a lot more about that. And the event is sponsored by Flaco Coquito. And uh, also, we can't thank enough. Uh, so many people are going to make this event huge. The Women's Networking Emporium, Viva Katerine, ABC Movers and Shakers, Moral, a Brooklyn-based urban clothing line, Future Vision Production, Sandra Guzman Photography, Marcus Isaac Photography, and, of course, uh, Cynthia Sepulveda Caballero, whose interview we had on last week. Uh, she does Flaco Coquito, and uh, that should about do it for Legends Radio, folks. This is Evan Ginsberg for Legends Radio, signing off.